Selamat sore semua. Terima kasih sudah mampir dan sudah masuk on time. Sebentar kita tunggu beberapa teman-teman lagi ya. Ini ada beberapa nama-nama yang sepertinya saya sudah kenal nih. Ada yang sudah daftar, ada yang siap berangkat, ada yang mau berangkat, ada yang lagi cari akomodasi kayaknya nih, tapi belum dibuka akomodasinya. Um, Oke, okay, I think we, Shona, I think I've just seen the name of William, uh, Professor William. Yes, uh, I just seen it. Admitted already, Pak. Morning, okay, everyone. Just... Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, oh, bro. there you go. Right. Okay. Um, tidak berlama-lama lagi, kita langsung mulai sambil menunggu teman-teman yang lain masuk juga. Um, saya ucapkan selamat sore semuanya. To Professor William, we say good morning to you. Um, hope it is a good weather in Glasgow today. Shona as well. Morning. Hi morning. everybody. Good to meet you all today. Right. Uh, we have Pak Alvin as well. Pak Alvin adalah orang Indonesia, tinggal di Jakarta. Beliau juga menjadi staff international office-nya University of Glasgow. Um, Selamat sore semua. Kemudian kita punya alumninya juga ya, Pak Alvin ya. Ada siapa aja Pak Alvin? Uh, selain Pak Alvin, sebetulnya kita ada empat orang lagi. Saya melihat ada satu yang pakai background kelas gue nih, Mbak Anita nih. Ah, ya, 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 betul, betul. Anita, apa sudah Halo, hadir? Pak. Halo, Pak. Oke, okay, Anita. Nah. nah, Anita ini baru lulus di Pak Hendra, dan Anita ini juga penerima Adam Smith Business School Scholarship, jadi boleh ditanya-tanya tuh gimana cara-caranya tuh, Pak. Oh iya, ntar dulu. Beasiswanya jangan disebut dulu, nanti dulu. Sekolah dulu. Okay. Sekolah dulu, siap. <laughs> Oke, okay. now I will hand over to Shona. You probably would like to say something and introduce, and introduce everyone from Glasgow. Yes? Yeah, thank you so much, Hendra, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be working with IBEC this morning, or this morning in the UK time, I know it's uh, this afternoon for those of you in, in Jakarta and in various other spaces around Indonesia. Um, so we're going to do a, a, a couple of different sessions today where, um, first of all, um, Pak Alfin will give you all a bit of an overview of the University of Glasgow. I know some of you may have already made an application um, and some of you may just be considering an application. So some of it might be information that you're familiar with, but hopefully um, all of you will, will learn a little bit about um, the University of Glasgow and some of the programmes and facilities that we have on offer. Um, we also have a number of our alumni with us today who will be able to talk to you a little bit about their experiences um, and we're also really excited to have um, Professor William Cushley or Bill as he is usually known as, um, more less formally. Um, so Bill who will be able to do, um, he's going to give us a bit of an insight into vaccinations, so a very topical subject at the moment. So talk to you a little bit about vaccinations and take any questions um, that you might have. I think the, the topic um, title is everything you want to know about vaccines but we're afraid to ask. Um, so we've got a couple of different segments here and then we will take some questions towards the end for you as well. So I'm going to pass you over to Alfin and he's going to give you a bit of an overview of the University of Glasgow. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shola. So I will share my screen. Pahendra, would you like to speak in Bahasa or English? Uh, it's up to you, Pak. Free to choose. Bahasa Indonesia boleh, biar seru. Gitu kan? Nanti baru ketemu uh, logat Scotland lagi biar yang alumninya pada kangen. Okay, mungkin Bahasa Indonesia aja, karena IELTS saya udah nggak valid kemarin. <laughs> Oke, sebentar ya teman-teman, saya akan share untuk screen saya. Oke. 
Ya, kelihatan ya, screen-nya sudah. Oke. Nah, jadi uh, saya adalah Alvin Firdaus. Uh, saya staff dari University of Glasgow yang ada di Indonesia. Jadi bisa dikatakan uh, untuk main kontaknya untuk teman-teman nanti kalau memang ada sesuatu hal yang ingin menanyakan uh, isu atau concern mengenai University of Glasgow profile ataupun akademik bisa langsung ke saya. Jadi mungkin teman-teman belum banyak tahu bahwa sebetulnya di Scotland itu secara keseluruhan banyak yang sudah ditemukan dan juga digunakan untuk sekarang-sekarang ini. Mungkin yang paling uh, mendasar adalah teman-teman terbiasa dengan obat kumur Listerin ya, itu salah satu penemunya adalah Joseph Lister, itu juga salah satu alumni dari kita. Dan juga mungkin teman-teman juga terbiasa dengan nama Adam Smith, salah satu bapak ekonomi dunia dan juga penemu mesin uap yaitu James Watt ya. Yang di mana dua nama ini kita gunakan menjadi school kita yaitu Adam Smith Business School dan juga James Watt School of Engineering. Jadi kita nama -nama kita. Nah sedikit eh, bisa dibilang story background dari University of Glasgow. Kita berdiri di tahun 1451, jadi usia kita sudah sekitar hampir 500 tahun lebih, 570. Yang dimana dengan perjalanannya waktu di tahun 2018 kita dinobatkan menjadi Scottish University of the Year. Jadi kalau teman-teman melihat perjalanan waktu ini juga kita diterima, kita menerima tujuh Nobel dari akademik untuk akademik yang saya pikir cukup banyak ya untuk kita untuk universitas seperti seperti kita. Kita juga dinobatkan menjadi uh, empat universitas tertua ya di English speaking country dan juga kedua tertua di London. Mungkin secara ranking ini adalah bagian yang sangat sangat penting. Di, di mana uh, biasanya teman-teman akan melihat masalah ini serius sekali. University Glasgow uh, berada di ranking 77, di mana ini adalah uh, ranking indikator dari QS Ranking ya, yang 2021. Sebetulnya cukup banyak untuk indikator ranking di dunia, dan biasanya di UK itu menggunakan ada dua atau tiga yang uh, cukup digunakan uh, selalu, yaitu Times Higher Education, uh, THA, atau juga uh, Guardian University League, dan juga Time Sunday uh, Good University. Overall, kita bisa bilang bahwa uh, University of Glasgow uh, selalu in top 20 di uh, UK ranking. Jadi inilah yang kita bisa tunjukkan uh, secara profile. Dan mungkin teman-teman bertanya, uh, kita masuk di Russell Group itu apa artinya? Kalau teman-teman membandingkan dengan negara lain, uh, itu di Australia misalnya, ada Group of Eight, atau di Amerika ada Ivy League, dan di UK kita punya yang namanya Russell Group. Kita berada di dalam Russell Group tersebut, di mana itu maksudnya adalah kita memberikan intensif higher research tertinggi ya, di dunia pun di UK sekalipun. Terus secara aplikasi dari Indonesia, saya mendapatkan data seperti ini bahwa kebanyakan masih education, lalu mungkin di industry family juga banyak tapi ke, agak sulit masuknya. Yang sungguh menarik adalah di bidang accounting and finance. Kebetulan di bidang accounting and finance ini kita sudah tiga tahun terakhir selalu ada di ranking pertama. Dan ini ini adalah kira-kira aplikasi yang cukup banyak diminati oleh orang Indonesia, termasuk di dalamnya ada computer science dan juga social policy. Mungkin untuk karena orang bertanya kira-kira alumni yang sekarang itu siapa kita bisa bilang salah satunya adalah Nicola Sturgeon. Dia adalah First Minister of South Scotland. Beliau juga lulusan dari University of Glasgow, mengambil law degree di sana. Dan juga yang paling menarik juga adalah si Mahiri Black, yaitu orang termuda di Parliament Member in UK. In, in UK ya. Jadi sebetulnya cukup banyak orang-orang yang alumni yang ada dari University of Glasgow memegang peranan penting di UK dan juga di Scotland. Nah, kalau misalnya menanya bagaimana sih cara apply ke University of Glasgow, mungkin saya akan lebih fokus ke masalah S2 ya, yang lebih ke master. Yang pasti memang nanti teman-teman akan menemukan di mana di salah satu bachelor degree kita atau master science kita, mereka mengutamakan atau mengharuskan untuk degree-nya itu 2.1 atau 2.2. Tapi intinya jangan khawatir, at least minimum kalau teman-teman IPK-nya 3,0 dari universitas kreditasinya A, 
atau kalau kreditasi EB itu minimum harus 3,2 itu pasti kita terima secara akademis nanti ditambah dengan dokumen yang pendukung lainnya seperti dua referensi letters dari kampus ataupun employer jadi memang di sini kita minta dua tapi kalau boleh teman-teman mengusahakan satu dikatakan kita kadang suka melihat ada sedikit masalah misalnya sudah lulus ya cukup lama minta ke kampus agak sulit atau misalnya yang kedua minta ke employer kita suka ditanya-tanya jadi mungkin salah satu aja tapi diusahakan kita mendapatkan jangan lupa juga masalah personal statement personal statement ini sangat-sangat penting dikarenakan kita juga ingin melihat kira-kira kenapa sih memilih program yang ada di Glasgow dan apa impact-nya nanti setelah teman-teman lulus bisa membawa ke industri atau bahkan untuk karir teman-teman sendiri. Jadi jangan lupa itu juga harus di-highlight sebaik mungkin. Untuk masalah CV, very straightforward. Dan IELTS-nya juga jangan lupa bahwa kita juga minta 6,5, di mana ada beberapa kasus kita minta di 6,5 untuk individual band-nya seperti di reading, listening, writing, dan speaking, ada juga yang di 6,5. Jadi teman-teman bisa double check lagi kira-kira untuk syarat bahasa Inggrisnya IELTS terutama itu uh, di mana levelnya. Nah, itu dia. Oke, untuk living cost di Glasgow uh, sebetulnya sebagai kota terbesar tempat di UK cukup beruntung uh, Glasgow itu tidak terlalu mahal. Di website memang kita sebutkan di 1030, tapi untuk student-student yang bisa yang hidup di sana kebanyakan antara 700 sampai 800 pound. Uh, pound. Nanti bisa double check lagi dengan cerita dari alumni yang sudah sudah selesai dan kembali ke Indonesia berapa kira-kira mereka menghabiskan untuk living allowance di sana. Masalah accommodation di Glasgow itu sebetulnya kita punya ada yang di off campus dan private accommodation di mana semua di manage by the university management. Jadi jangan khawatir we guarantee untuk teman-teman yang ambil undergraduate terutama kita garansi untuk mendapatkan accommodation tersebut. Kebanyakan untuk yang postgraduate, nanti masalah accommodation ini akan banyak dibantu oleh yang namanya PPI Greater Glasgow. Jadi sungguh sungguh beruntung karena dari komiti-komiti yang PPI Greater Glasgow ini bisa dikatakan 80% dari mereka sekolahnya di University of Glasgow. Dan tim ini pun sebelum mereka berangkat ke Glasgow, kita atau saya dari kantor Indonesia Sebelum masa pandemik, kita kita bisa kumpul di kantor University Glasgow di Jakarta. Kebetulan kita punya kantor, kita kumpul di sana. Tapi karena pandemik seperti ini, semuanya everything by Zoom. Jadi uh, jangan khawatir, saya dari uh, staff yang ada di Jakarta, dan begitu, begitu juga dengan tim IBEC nantinya, kita akan berkoordinasi untuk membuat uh, acara pre-departure briefing. Jadi kita akan uh, memberikan semua informasi yang dibutuhkan oleh teman-teman from the day one harus bagaimana, lalu masalah uh, leasing agreement seperti apa, dan itu semua akan melibatkan PPI Greater Glasgow uh, dalam prosesnya nantinya. Jadi jangan, jangan khawatir. Nah, mungkin untuk teman-teman kita yang uh, beragama muslim, uh, juga jangan jangan khawatir dikarenakan University Glasgow sangat memperhatikan untuk kita menjalankan ibadah yang sangat, uh, yang yang saya bilang bisa dibilang sangat sempurna dikarenakan semua fasilitas sholat ini diletakkan di main campus kita yang kampus yang yang utama dan teman-teman bisa langsung uh, ya melakukan aktivitasnya dengan dengan mudah ya itu tempat wudhu kita sudah sediakan tidak perlu ngangkat kaki ke wastafel uh, air hangat juga kita sediakan handuk dan tempat sholat ini pun juga kita sediakan di library jadi teman-teman tidak perlu dari library uh, harus jalan ke ruangan ini lagi untuk melakukan sholat kita sudah sediakan di library di lantai Lalu untuk kota Glasgow sendiri, banyak yang bilang, dan sudah terbukti dua tahun berturut-turut, di tahun 2019 dan tahun 2021, kita dinobatkan menjadi The World Friendly City, itu by Rightblood, itu bisa dicek di internet. Dan kita juga masuk di uh, the top 10 best cities in the world, ya. artinya uh, kita masuk the most livable cities in the world juga, walaupun mungkin bukan di posisi pertama, tapi kalau tidak salah itu di posisi nomor 8. Lalu kita juga banyak untuk uh, public garden, museum, di mana museum yang terbesar di Glasgow pun itu attached ya, dengan University Glasgow juga. Jadi kalau teman-teman uh, ingin melihat masalah museum dan lain-lain, itu tinggal jalan aja dari University Complex yang kita punya. Dan juga uh, City of Glasgow dinobatkan menjadi City of Music ya. Sebelum pandemik itu uh, kondisinya sangat-sangat ramai seperti yang ada di screen saya ini. 
bisa dikatakan hampir setiap minggu kita punya festival musik tapi dikarenakan ada pandemi kita harus postpone beberapa aktivitas dan juga kita punya SSI Hydro itu international venue yang bisa dibilang the fourth busiest in the world yang seharusnya tuh eh, tahun 2020 eh, ada rencana untuk konsernya Celine Dion cuma dikarenakan pandemi mau nggak mau kita harus postpone kembali dan ini gambar beberapa keadaan di Glasgow kemarin ini sempat snowing dan di bawah uh, ini adalah student-student kita yang baru recently enroll. Yang paling kiri itu adalah student yang kembali ke Glasgow mengambil PhD-nya namanya Mas Taufik. Dan yang paling kanan itu adalah Mas Ogi, dia adalah presiden dari PPI Greater Glasgow. Lalu yang di tengah ini kita bikin snow apa tuh? Si apa boneka salju dan ini keadaan waktu awal-awal di bulan Januari. Dan ini subway yang kita gunakan untuk commute kita dari tempat akomodasi dan juga ke kampus. Daily basis pasti akan digunakan. Dan sungguh beruntung karena station dari subway ini, Hillhead Station, ya itu adalah di mana University Glasgow itu berada. Jadi teman-teman tinggal turun dari Hillhead Station itu bisa lebih 5-10 menit jalan tergantung jalannya. Dan kebanyakan dari spot station-station ini adalah di mana Uh, teman-teman juga tinggal ya jadi ada yang di Kelvin Bridge, Saint George, ada juga yang di Govan, ada yang di Ibrox dan dari Hillhead atau dari University Glasgow ke City itu di Saint Enoch ya ataupun di Cannon Street itu kurang lebih hampir hanya 10 menit kalau naik subway. Nah kalau Glasgow bisa dikatakan aman karena sudah terbukti menjadi uh, tuan rumah dari berbagai event internasional. So it's very safe. Uh, 2014 kita host untuk Commonwealth Games, 2018 kita European Championship, lalu 2020 kita juga menjadi salah satu host untuk UFA Euro, tapi lagi-lagi harus kita postpone. Dan kota Glasgow sudah dinobatkan menjadi European Capital City of Sport tahun 2023. So hopefully kita bisa uh, tetap menjadi host untuk uh, World Cycling Championship. Nah, mungkin ini video saya skip, kita langsung ke Pertanyaan aja ya nanti Pak Hendra ya. Mungkin itu akhir dari presentasi saya Pak Hendra. Terima kasih. Yang mau tanya, tanya. boleh ditahan boleh dulu. Buka. ya Chat boxnya juga belum saya buka. Jadi setelah ini kita akan masuk ke presentasi dari Profesor William Cosley. Um, begitu ya Pak Alvin ya. Baik. Uh, Oke, okay. uh, Bill, you may want to start your presentation, please. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, let me get the uh, the slides up, if that's okay. No, that doesn't work. Uh, where were we? Teams. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep, very clear. Okay. Good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope the weather is nice and fine in Jakarta and elsewhere in um, in Indonesia. It's quite a grey morning here in Glasgow. So what I've been asked to do this morning is simply to give a, a short uh, talk on the area of vaccines, which is quite topical, uh, as you know. So let's make sure all the slides are working. So can we see, oh dear. Uh, Alfin, can you see that? Just a thumbs up? Yes. Yep, that's good, that's good. Good, good. right. Okay, so, um, Glasgow is a centre for virology. We, we hold the one of the national centres for virology research, the Centre for Viral Research in Glasgow. And we have been participating in some of the clinical trials around the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. We're also one of the centres for genome sent, uh, sequencing uh, for COVID-19 as it sweeps around the planet and generates variants as it goes. Uh, vaccine research isn't my area. I'm an immunologist by training. I'm interested in the cells that make antibody. But what I want to do today is cover some of the history 
of vaccines and show that those who are working in the area of vaccine development just now are standing on the shoulders of giants. And no talk would be um, complete without asking a question. So in the chat, I want you to answer the question in, in the next second, a few seconds. When do you think the first vaccine trial was actually performed? Okay, so we're used to hearing about trials in the media just now, but when was the very first vaccine trial actually performed? And in the course of my talk today, I'm going to take a look at a range of um, vaccine types that have been deployed in the past and are being deployed at the moment. So before we turn to when the first vaccine trial came along, let's consider what's needed uh, to make a vaccine and what we're aiming to do with a vaccine when we bring a subject into the, uh, the room to vaccinate them in whatever way we're doing it. So what are vaccines and why do we vaccinate individuals? So the first type of vaccine that we can think about is a form of the organism that causes disease. Um, and that's a pathogen. So it generates pathology or generates disease. And that's usually administered as a killed form of the um, organism, which is the form of the Sinovac uh, COVID vaccine that's being used in Indonesia, or a compromised form, what I would call attenuated. So it can infect a cell, but it can't replicate properly. It can't kill the cell and carry on um, to generate a, a more profound infection. So it can be the organism itself or a related organism. Uh, either in a killed or compromised oblique uh, attenuated form. Alternatively, it can be a component of a pathogen. So it can be a bit of it, and we'll see a picture of that later on. It could be something that's on the surface of a bacterial cell or a viral envelope or viral capsid. And it's normally a protein. And the reason it's a protein is we're very skilled across the world in purifying proteins or generating them by recombinant means, that is to say, cloning the gene, putting it in another organism and making literally uh, kilogram amounts of the protein we need to be able to inject into subjects to vaccinate them. A popular form, certainly from 150 years ago and still used to this day, are inactivated toxins. So that's where you take a toxin like tetanus toxoid uh, you purify it, you boil it up in, in, in a test tube with a little bit of formalin, and that makes it inactive. It can no longer cause disease, but the immune system still recognizes it. So you can vaccinate someone with the toxoid, the inactivated toxin, and that protects them when they meet the real, um, if you like, weapons grade toxin that they might encounter. And finally, in the modern era, uh, people are rolling up their sleeves across the world at the moment to get RNA vaccines, which are little nanoparticles wrapped around uh, an, an RNA molecule that encodes a component of the spike uh, of the coronavirus, a spike protein. So again, it's a component vaccine just generated a slightly different way. So what we are trying to do is to generate this kind of uh, idea here. So for those of you who are not scientists, I apologize. This is a little bit of science. We're going to see some data as well, but it's just where the, the spots on the graph are that matter, not, not the detail. So on the y-axis here, we're looking at antibody levels. And on the, the x-axis, we're looking at time. So if we imagine the origin of this graph, we, we stick someone with a needle and a syringe containing tetanus toxoid, and we measure what's happening in their blood over a week. In the yellow or green um, line, we see the beginnings of an immune response. Um, and it's got a type of antibody called IgM. You don't need to really worry about that. Um, but this response is slow. So that peak is about seven to 10 days. There's not very much of it and it's low affinity. So it doesn't stick very well to the target. You can then let that subside and wait. And in the UK, we're waiting three months now for um, the, the, the time between our first and secondary immunizations for COVID. But if you give the second um, injection, then you see a very different response. So the red line now is very much higher, persists for a long time, and there's a lot of it, and it's very fast. So that peak is one to two days. 
So in a memory response or a secondary response, it's much faster, there's a lot more of it, and it's much, much better. And that's what vaccines aim to generate. They want to generate these um, long-lived immune responses that protect the host from disease. So once you've established that second, that right-hand um, type of response, you generally have it for your entire life. Um, it's not, not clear if that's true for coronaviruses, but um, it may well be the case. The, the, the current data suggests that's good. Right, so what kind of answers did you come up with for when the first vaccine experiment was done? I can't see the chat, but it doesn't really matter. But the first vaccine experiment was done in 1796. I'll bet most of your answers were something like 1910 or maybe 1895. But the first experiment was done in 1796. And this goes back to a chap called Edward Jenner showing here. And he, like many um, medics and scientists of the time, uh, was interested in smallpox, which was a disease that was just sweeping across the world, killing millions of people uh, with very frequent outbreaks popping up here and there. And Jenner's great step forward was he noticed in rural England down near Bristol, where he lived, that people who worked on farms and the, the media style of this is it was the milkmaids who were milking the cows. So cows get a related disease called cowpox. And it turned out that the, the milkmaids who were working on the udders, generating the milk, uh, they got small scabs consistent with cowpox. But what Jenner noticed was, even if there was a massive outbreak of smallpox in the region, the milkmaids never got the disease. So he reasoned that the cow virus, and they didn't know it was a virus at the time, but the cowpox, as it was called, protected somehow against smallpox. And in an experiment he'd never get um, permission for today, what he did was he took uh, a local lad, a little eight-year-old boy, took some of the material from the cow lesion and scraped it into the boy's arm. And then he waited a bit and then he challenged him with the same material taken from a smallpox lesion. And you can see those lesions or those um, um, pox marks, if you will, on the bottom left-hand side. And he scraped that in and the boy did not get the disease. And he had been vaccinated and that comes from the French lavash for the cow. And that's how vaccines were born and how the name arose. So very quickly on the next slide, a tiny bit of explanation of how that happens. So smallpox is caused by a virus called variola. It infects you and I, it causes terrible disease. Whereas cowpox is caused by a, a virus called vaccinia. And that will infect us, but it doesn't cause serious disease. You get a little warped but, but not, not much more than that. But the two viruses look similar and they've got bits on their surface that are almost identical. So if someone encounters vaccinia virus, they make an immune response to it. And that very happily happens to recognize variola as well. So exposure to one virus protects against another here by what's called cross reaction. So the immune response to the cow pox virus, vaccinia, gives an immune response in the patient that will also destroy variola and so prevent smallpox disease. So this obviously isn't a, an 18, uh, a 1786 laboratory, not least because the chap in the picture here was one of my master's students a few years ago. So, um, and he wasn't working on smallpox. I can tell you that for free. We never worked on that in my lab. So the, Vaccine for smallpox has been spectacularly successful. So there was a mass vaccination program uh, across the world in, in the middle of the last century. And in wealthy countries and it, you know, in places like Jakarta, where you've got a great health infrastructure, it works brilliantly. You just vaccinate everybody. The virus is nowhere to go and the population is protected. But in Africa and perhaps in some of the outlying islands in Indonesia, it's a bit trickier. Um, to ensure a population-wide coverage. So what was done was this ring immunization. And this resonates a little bit with what is talked about in the context of herd immunity. So if we look here on the top left, in the middle of the three rings, there's a little red figure called the index case. So this is the, the individual who's infected with smallpox. 
So that individual will have a range of contacts. So in the dark blue uh, are his immediate family. Those are his close contacts. Those are the people who are in the kitchen, who are eating dinner with him, playing in the yard. Next are, in the light blue, intermittent contacts. So that's people who live nearby the same street, uh, perhaps the same small village. And then in the, I guess, yellow ring uh, are the more distant populations. So these are people who live half a mile or more away or perhaps in, in the region, perhaps the next town. So how was that coped with? So what was done was to take our index case here in the red and as soon as that's discovered, the public health people move in, they care for that case, and then they vaccinate the immediate family. So everybody in the house rolls up their sleeve and they get a vaccine shot. And that's great. And then the public health people move out, they get in their trucks or on their bikes, and they go in a five mile radius round that index case and they vaccinate everybody there. And because it's it, historically, you know, 50 years ago, you know, we didn't have Toyota trucks and motorbikes to get around. It meant that within a five mile ring, nobody could get in or out. And that included the virus. So the virus was contained within a ring of vaccinated individuals who had immune capability. And the virus could infect them, but the immune response would kill them. So it ran out of host very quickly and could not uh, continue to cause problems. Fantastically successful, smallpox, no longer exists other than in freezers in the United States and in uh, China and the Soviet Union. It's there because somebody might make a weapon with it and you need to be able to um, have other virus to work with it to try and find ways to combat it. But it's been a real success story and the last recorded formal case was in Bangladesh in 1975. So the smallpox vaccine program has worked really well. Oops, sorry, it's not working that way. Okay, very quickly, we probably all had tetanus vaccinations. So tetanus is caused by a toxin made by a bacterium called Clostidium tetani. And uh, C. tetani is all over the place. It's certainly in, in the soil in your, in your garden. So if you're a little person rolling around in the garden and you cut yourself, you're almost certainly going to be infected by this organism. And that encounter could be fatal for you. So young people in particular are very susceptible. How is this vaccinated against? As I said earlier, you make the protein toxin, you, you grow the strains that make it, you isolate the protein and you boil it up quite literally with a bit of formaldehyde, which makes the protein all stick together and it can't work as a toxin. But what it does do is it retains its capacity to provoke an immune response, it remains immunogenic. Uh, but it doesn't cause disease. So this is given as a shot in your upper arm. Um, when you're little, it's given as a triple vaccine with diphtheria and pertussis toxins made the same way. And you can see in the graphs here, just for incidence, in the United States, when the vaccine came in in the late 40s, the numbers of cases of Texas fell off a cliff. And specifically looking at neonates on the right-hand side, again, we can see from the 60s onwards, a massive decline in incidence of disease driven by this toxin. So I'm prepared to bet most people in the room or, or in your rooms around Indonesia have been vaccinated with tetanus toxoid to give a good protective response. I keep tapping. Okay, another one is hepatitis. This is an important one. There's 2 billion people worldwide infected by this. So the probability of bumping into someone uh, who might be carrying this and infecting you is very high. Um, again, infection in infants is a particular problem um, because if they're infected as very young people, they tend to carry the, the virus for their whole life and it can promote cancers. So this is a Scottish success story. Alas, it was our friends in the East at Edinburgh who were in the vanguard here. It was the Murrays um, who took this forward. So if you look at the, the picture of the virus here, there's something called large surface protein, um, hepatitis B surface antigen, HBSAG. So that's a big component of the virus. So it's possible to take the gene for that and make the protein in yeast and purify. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, it's put in a salty water solution, a saline solution, and given as an intramuscular injection. And it works brilliantly. Again, we can see here 
the incidence falls off a cliff. So vaccination works really well. So you've got a high number of cases, you introduce the vaccine into the population and the number of cases drops dramatically. So this is called a subunit vaccine. So there's nothing live here. It's just a protein that your immune system recognizes as not you, i.e. non-self, and makes a response to it. So these subunit vaccines are also used in COVID. And another one that I know is being used in Indonesia is the Novavax formulation, and that is a subunit vaccine. Another subunit vaccine that's used in across the world and in Indonesia is for um, uh, HPV or human papillomavirus. And it's known as a polyvalent vaccine. So this is exactly the same idea as hepatitis. In this case, we know Human papillomavirus causes warts, but can cause cervical cancer with some of them. And what is given in Indonesia is a vaccine called Gardasil, which, like the hepatitis one we saw in the last example, takes a surface component of the virus and presents it to the immune system. But the difference here is it takes a slightly different component from slightly different papillomaviruses. So the Gardasil 4 that is prevalent and uh, is used in Indonesia has the L1 component from HPV 6, 11, 16, which is the cancer causing one, and 19. Actually, that should be 18. That's a mistake on my part. And you can see there on the graph that again, the introduction of the vaccine caused a dramatic drop in cases of women who were presenting with uh, indications of development of cancer. So we've seen subunit vaccines, killed vaccines, other um, types of um, vaccine as well, uh, a related virus. So there's a lot of concern at the moment around um, coronavirus, COVID-19. But there are some lessons from history that we're relearning at the moment. And those are the lessons from polio. So polio is uh, an enterovirus. That means it infects your gut. And most people who get polio virus feel a bit sick for a few days. They've got diarrhea, runny tummy, but broadly nothing much else. A small number, about one in 20, you find virus in the blood, um, which is not great, but it's still not problematic. But 1% of cases have an involvement in the central nervous system. And when the virus infects, um, neurons, it destroys them, and those neurons no longer control muscle activity. So it causes paralysis in a tiny fraction of patients. But in a population, that's a gigantic number of individuals. And the fear of this paralytic polio was enormous. So back in the 40s and 50s, children who were infected with this could finish up in these machines here called iron lungs. So they did the breathing for you because the virus had destroyed the, um, the neurons that controlled the muscles in your lungs to let you breathe. Uh, there's only one man left in the whole world in Texas who now lives in an iron lung. Uh, and if anybody's interested, I can send you the link to the Guardian article. He had a reasonably productive life. Um, he was able to get out of the lung for about 30 years. Um, and worked as a lawyer. And apparently he was quite a combative lawyer. Um, and one can readily understand why if he spent much of his childhood here. So there was a big clamor uh, for vaccines. There were big queues of people lining up to be vaccinated. But the story here, and it's relevant to our times with COVID, uh, the story here is what kind of vaccine do you make? So this was pioneered by two chaps, Salt and Sabin, who took quite different approaches. So Salk took the view of let's grow the virus up, kill it and stick it in the arm. And that's exactly what he did. So uh, that's called the inactivated polio vaccine. And he knew there were three strains going around. So they grow up three strains, they put them together and they kill them and they stick them in your arm. And it works really well, as we'll see in a minute. Um, his competitor, Sabin took a different approach. So what he did was generated viruses that had been passaged so that they could infect you, but wouldn't cause neuropathic syndrome. 
So you get infected and you still get sick. You get all the tummy um, problems, but you do not get neuropathic symptoms. And this is called an attenuated live vaccine. And the great trick here was he put it in a suspension or on a sugar cube and you take it orally. So it's the oral polio vaccine. And Shona and I had this when we were we were little. You get it on a sugar cube. When you're older, you get it in this saline suspension that this little chap here uh, is getting. So two different outcomes. The next slide's a little busy. They both work. But if you look down the slide and think about what we're ex uh, experiencing today, both vaccines work, prevent paralysis, but they don't, in one case, doesn't prevent reinfection. And in the other case, it does. And the reason is the Sabin attenuated vi uh, vaccine given orally provokes an immune response that protects the mouth and the airways and the gut. Whereas the other one given intramuscularly really only gets antibodies in the blood. And you can see on the slide, we don't need to spend time on this, the salt vaccine protects you against disease. So do the coronavirus vaccines. They stop you getting severe COVID. It's not clear if they prevent you getting infected, whereas the Sabin uh, polio vaccine does. Sabin is good at controlling epidemics, pandemics. Salk is less good at doing that. At the moment, we've got Salk type COVID vaccines. But there are trials at the moment for giving a, a like a, a nebulizer, an asthma puffer dose of the, the virus in the AstraZeneca vaccine to generate what's called mucosal immunity, immunity that will protect the nose, the mouth and the airways. Like smallpox, polio is now essentially uh, off the table. There's only two countries in the world that regularly report natural infection. And the goal, like smallpox for the World Health Organization, is to eradicate this completely. Let's now skip through um, some thinking about COVID that's on everyone's mind. So this is vaccine platforms. We've talked about some of those. So an inactivated vaccine can be polio. We've looked at that. So the Sinopharm, Sinovac vaccine that's being used for COVID in Indonesia is an in inactivated vaccine. There are subunit vaccines. We saw that with hepatitis. Novavax, again popular in Indonesia, is a subunit vaccine. Um, Virus-like particles, these are these polymeric ones, papilloma, that might come along quite soon for COVID because there are multiple variants, as we're all hearing. You can use a viral vector, and we'll see that in a second, and this is the Oxford AstraZeneca style, which again is one of the three vaccines being used in Indonesia. And finally, there's the RNA vaccines, which we'll see a little bit about. So I know I've been speaking for a little longer than I'd intended, so we'll skip through this. First up is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. What this is, is this is a bit like the smallpox idea. So what's used here is an adenovirus. So it's a virus that infects your adenoids and tissue like that. Um, but it's a chimpanzee virus. So it can infect you and I, but it won't cause disease. But the fact that it infects us tricks the immune system into being activated. And what's done in the COVID vaccine is you insert the gene for um, the spike protein of the virus. And, and the spike protein is almost like a big key that the virus uses to unlock the cell to get into it. So if you stop the key working, you stop infection. And so that gene is put into the virus. And when it infects your cells, that spike protein is made and the immune response recognizes it and sets out to... Uh, destroy it, the capability of the spike protein to do its job, such that when the virus arrives, we have antibodies against the spike protein and infection is uh, controlled. Uh, it works well. So here's some data. All you have to look at here is how high up the little red spots are, if they're red or brown. I'm afraid that color isn't my thing. Um, so we can see here with a single boost, after 28 days, we've got nice high levels of antibody. And if you give a boost, they come up very quickly, much more quickly indeed. And over on the right-hand side in panel B is the amount of antibody you find in people who've had disease and recovered, so-called convalescent plasma. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine gives you great antibody responses. 
And because they make this IgG, if you think back to the first slide, it means you've got memory and it's going to persist. What about the, the, the new generation of RNA vaccines? Um, so these might just win the Nobel Prize. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I think they've got a chance. Vaccines don't have a long history of this since, uh, since the, the, the late 1800s. So what's done here is to take the RNA, the coding part for the spike protein, and package it in a soap bubble, a lipid nanoparticle. Uh, and because it's like a soap bubble, the outside of your cells are soap bubbles as well. You know, they're full of lipid molecules, little fatty molecules. And so the lipid nanoparticle collides with a cell and fuses with it. So the two soap bubbles become one bigger soap bubble and the contents of the bubble or the nanoparticle are released into the cell. So you package up the nanoparticles again, you put them into the muscle and injection into the muscle and the nanoparticles go into the cell and they drive production of the spike protein, which then sits on the surface of the cell and the immune system says, hello, this is something we've not seen before and react to it. And again, it works really well. I was surprised, but they're quite cleverly designed and they work really well. So again, some busyness on the slide here. All you need to look at is the size of the buildings in downtown Jakarta here. So these skyscrapers at different times tell you how much antibody you're making. It's not particularly dose dependent. So the immune response will respond to a very small amount and it doesn't really get any better. So there's small to high doses, they're much the same. And again, in, in the black bar at the end, the amount you're seeing in recovered patients. So you get very high antibody levels after about three weeks and neutralizing antibody takes a little longer. It's actually there yeah. earlier, it's doing its job, which is why you can't find it. it. At a population, and this is the important slide, if you remember no other data than this, it works. So there's two lines here. So the, the little blue line at the bottom is a population experiment where something like the numbers are down there at the bottom, but 10,000 people have been given the Pfizer shots. And on the red line is a slightly smaller group of people who've not been given Pfizer shots. They've been given just a, an injection of salty water, a so-called placebo. And what you see is the lines part company. So the Y axis here is measuring the number of people with COVID disease. So the vaccinated population doesn't increase levels of disease after about a week. And we saw that that's the time it takes for an immune response to kick in. But after a week, those who have not been vaccinated, that population shows a continued increase in disease. So both the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccines work well. They work well for individuals and they reduce the incidence of COVID in the population. They are doing their job very well. Next up, uh, Novavax. So this is coming to Indonesia quite soon. This is like the hepatitis. Uh, it's a combination of hepatitis and um, HPV because this is a, a trimeric form, which means there's three of them in one space. Um, and that mimics what S protein like looks like on the virus. And again, again, just look at the heights of the, the little dots here. So after a couple of weeks, we see very high levels of antibody in the plasma of the patients. Again, comparable in the blue dots at the end to what you find in recovered subjects. So Novavax works. It's gonna work brilliantly in Indonesia as well. Next, there's the Sputnik V vaccine. This comes out of Russia. Uh, this is a, a human virus, it's an adenovirus. And it works too, as on the last slide, there's a difference between vaccinated in the blue and unvaccinated in the red line. So the unvaccinated population continues to show disease development, whereas the vaccinated individuals uh, as a population show no increase in incidence of COVID disease. And finally, the Sinovac uh, looks busy, but again, all you need to do is look at the height of the little bars here. And at various times, be it 14 days or 18 days, whether you're, you're looking at total antibody or antibody that prevents infection, you can see that it rises very, very 
potently, particularly after 28 days. So the uh, Sinovac is an inactivated virus. It's a bit like the Salk polio virus that we talked about. And again, it's given as an intramuscular shot, but they all work. And that's the, the take home message. So when you go to talk to your friends and family over coffee or on Zoom calls, as we all have to do now, and they're asking you about virus vaccines and being worried about it for COVID, there is no need to be worried. And the best thing you can do for your family and friends is when your letter arrives saying, get yourself along to the local hospital or health center to have your vaccine shot, go and take it. It doesn't matter which of the current five or six vaccine designs are out there, they all work. And all of these data are new, these data are less than three weeks old. So I've been following this for, for teaching in Glasgow um, and they all work really, really well. So to sum up, all the vaccines, both historic and um, COVID vaccines at the moment, give good robust immune responses that are protective. There's positive reflects for the individual, they don't get severe COVID, and there's an effect at population levels. It seems that incident that somehow the vaccines are managing to prevent transmission. I don't have a good explanation for that at the moment. A single goal dose gives protection. We saw that in those curves that go in different directions, but a booster dose plainly helps. So although governments are probably wisely saying, get your shot and wait three months, um, that's working because the populations are becoming vaccinated, giving COVID nowhere to go and helping populations around the world recover from the current uh, pandemic. Apologies, I've spoken for probably five or six minutes longer than I intended. Sorry, Shona. Shona will now call me William. I'm, I'm known as William only when I've done something wrong. Uh, I'm mostly known as Bill. So with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take any questions that are in the chat uh, or be brave and ask a question. That's what being a scientist is about, asking questions. Thank you all very much indeed. Shona, would you like to moderate and uh, pass on the questions to Bill? Yeah, certainly, no problem. And Bill, please, I, I'll stick with Bill because I, I know that I find that really interesting. So um, please don't worry about going slightly over over time. It's such a an interesting topic oh. at the moment and keen to, to always learn more about these things. So we've got a couple of questions that have come through, um, Bill. Um, yeah. And what I, um, I know that um, you sort of mentioned you're not a, a, a sort of vaccine specialist as such, but hopefully you might be able to answer some of these or we can take a note of them um, and always come back to people if they're perhaps a little bit, uh, if we need to sort of speak to some of our colleagues to get some specialist answers. So um, I have a, we have a couple from one person in particular, I'm assuming someone who is keen on studying something in the field. There's a couple of really good questions from Dean. Um, so I've got a question here around um, so this is from Diane, who has asked, um, I would like to know about the um, World Health the World Health Organization's vaccine efficiency threshold is 50%. Is that good enough? Is there any scientific reason to put 50% as the threshold? Yeah, that's that's a really that's a really good perceptive question. Um, if half the population is vaccinated, that's going to cut an R number very dramatically. So um, remember the R number is not linear. It's, it's, uh, it's not arithmetic, it's geometric. So it's, all, it's logarithmic. So if you're cutting the capacity to translate, uh, to, to transmit in by half, that is a reasonable goal. Most of the, the vaccines that are out there at the moment have efficacies well north of 60%. Another reason it might be set at 50% is across populations, you might get a slightly different response to a given vaccine. So one of the issues that the Oxford AstraZeneca people were concerned about in the initial work with, with their construct was they didn't have enough um, people in the 80 upwards age group in their initial trial. So there are lots of people in the 40, 50, 60 age group, but not later on. And you might have seen in the newspapers that some of the European countries said you don't have enough data to demonstrate 
uh, as an answer to, to your next question about safety, um, uh, the next, the, there was not enough data to generate effectiveness in those older people. So Germany and Belgium, I think, said, no, we're not going to give uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine there because it wouldn't make the 50% the threshold. But when you look across the country as a whole, it comfortably uh, overcomes it. So you would not have stopped giving 40 year olds the o Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine simply because you couldn't make the threshold um, for the older people. Um, I guess like lots of things, um, so Dean, you're, you're obviously a scientist. Uh, the same question exists to um, setting p-values at 0.05. You have to start somewhere. So you would never put out on the market a vaccine that didn't have benefit for at least half the population. And I suspect that's where that 50% comes from. Thanks, Phil. There's another question then around, um, and again, this is um, around, this again from Dean who's asked, which is safer, an attenuated or a vector virus vaccine and why? Okay, right. So that's, again, a really good question. So the issue- could I, maybe, I was say, Phil, could I maybe ask you if you're able to, could you do a very quick, because um, I don't know that I don't know the difference between attenuated and vector virus. Could you explain the difference for those of us that are perhaps less less informed already? <laughs> okay, right. So uh, an attenuated virus is a virus that will infect your cells, but cannot grow sufficiently to explode out of the cells or be released by the cells. So. Uh, a virus like coronavirus infects your cells, makes many thousands of copies of itself in, inside the cell, and then is released as little bubbles from the membrane. It buds off to go and infect other cells. So an attenuated virus would be one that infects the cell and begins to copy itself, but somehow can't package itself and be uh, released or shed uh, or budded out from the cell. Um, a virus... A, vector virus is the uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So where you've got a virus or, or like smallpox, where you've got a virus that normally infects another species and causes disease, will infect humans, but won't cause disease, but it's still enough to alert the immune system. Um, so Dean's question is, which is safer, the attenuated or vector virus? Both of them suffer from the same potential problem, which is if you arrange for a virus to be attenuated, that is to say not very effective, it can mutate and become really effective and cause disease again. So that's one of the dangers there. Uh, it turns out that in, in polio, in the Sabin vaccine, um, that's you know when you vaccinate people with it on the sugar cube, um, they get infected, they develop antibodies and they're great, but they shed the virus, they, they wee it out again. And what they wee out are mutants that are more infectious than the virus strain that came in, but they still don't cause disease because they've got an immune response. Um, the virus vector, the problem there is you eventually generate antibodies against the, the virus itself. So if you're using a chimpanzee adenovirus to put something interesting in, you will eventually make an immune response to that virus and it compromises its ability to deliver the vaccine, if you will. Um, in the context of the current vaccines, Deanne, uh, the majority of the data that were available coming up to October, November last year were safety studies where people would go in and they'd get, like all drug type trials, um, you give someone an increasing dose and monitor them for adverse effects and there'll be very 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 little of that. Uh, the sequencing um, approaches allow us to keep track of how vaccine strains might mutate in individuals who are vaccinated. So it allows us to figure out if the virus is beginning to react to the, the, the human immune response at population level almost in real time. So uh, they are both safe. They, they have similar problems in terms of mutation that makes them less safe. Um, and they also ultimately potentially generate immune responses that 
cripples the delivery system. The nanoparticles less so. Immune response against the right virus. A, a vector virus gives you almost an off-target effect, which means you can only use that delivery system once or twice. But they're both they're both safe. Great, thank you. And then we've got another question from Anissa, who's asked um, that um, at her place, so I, I presume maybe in her workplace or her university, there's a lot of people who refuse to be vaccinated, particularly with there being a lot of fake news around vaccines, so people not believing that vaccines can help them. Um, is there a vaccine that can be used without any side effects, or or is is that just part of having a vaccine that there that is usually some side effects for most humans? Yeah, I mean the, the, the that that's a great question, Anissa, and and you're going to have to be an ambassador for uh, vaccines back back in your place. Um, in terms of you know local people, go along to your local university, um, you know, um, UGM if you're down in Yogya or UE if you're in town in Jakarta and get the biology guys to come out and talk as I have done about this. The current suite of vaccines are all fine. Uh, there are very, very few instances. The AstraZeneca trial was stopped for a bit because there was a, one of the, the subjects had an adverse reaction that had nothing to do with the virus. Um, all, all vaccines, as I said on my very first slide, aim to give you a beneficial effect, and all of them do. With the possible exception of the Sabin polio virus, which you get in a sugar cube or a little salty suspension, there is, a, there is an effect um, that people would regard as negative. So I don't know if anyone's had their shot yet, but it's given in the upper arm. That will be sore, okay? The main thing is look away, it hurts less if you don't see the needle going in. Um, but you get a little local immune response, a little inflammation. It's like if you cut yourself, you get that little sore raised bump. You'll get the same thing with any vaccine. It doesn't matter if it's the virus vaccine or uh, the nanoparticles. Simply the injection gives you a little bit of uh, um, a localized inflammation that's a bit uncomfortable. The booster... The booster hurts a little more because you've actually got an immune response that's going to go to the muscle and try and destroy what's there. And that one can actually make you feel a little uncomfortable. So your body temperature will go up a little bit. You'll feel a little bit feverish, maybe a wee bit nauseous, but that will pass after 48 hours. And from my perspective, um, thinking as an individual who's happy to roll up his sleeve and get whichever vaccine they offer me, uh, from, an from an individual perspective and a population perspective, once I'm vaccinated, I will consider that I have done my duty to my colleagues like Shona uh, at work and the population that lives around me, the people that are in the shop that I go to uh, to buy groceries, um, the people that I might meet in the street uh, or any kind of social gathering that one is permitted to go to. There is a lot of fake news out there. Uh, as I said, I think talking to your biology professors at the Indonesian universities and asking them to be champions of what's going on with these vaccines is a good thing to do. And via Shona and Alfin, if you need me to help, um, I'm happy to come along and give a similar talk in your place and answer questions for people. Well, thanks, Bill. And another question, I think sort of we've got a couple that are themed, I guess, round about that now. So there's one from Ari who's asking, um, why why is va why are vaccines only effective for some people? So sometimes they're not effective for everyone, as we know, um, or they can cause worse side effects for, for some people. Is there is there a reason for that? Oh, yeah, that, that there's multiple, re <laughs> multiple reasons for that. Some of them are, are, are quite complicated. So a vaccine might not be effective in a patient who is slightly immunodeficient. That is to say their immune system hasn't been put together properly and a part of it doesn't work right. So depending on the design of a vaccine, uh, that vaccine might not drive production of productive immunity in those individuals that are immunocompromised. Similarly, people who are immunosuppressed uh, so these would be individuals who, for whatever reason, have been given drugs that stop their immune system working uh, to maximum effect. Um, they too might not make an effective immune response. 
Uh, so immunosuppression can sometimes happen naturally, but generally it's, it's, due, it's as a result of some kind of treatment for something else. Um, a more complex explanation depends on what your body recognizes as self. So we've got a big set of genes that controls that. And occasionally you might not have quite the right genes to make the right immune response. Uh, but across a, popu a human population, that won't matter. Uh, also, because of the way these vaccines are designed, and I didn't go into the molecular details, you will make what's called a polyclonal response, which means many uh, cells. So you'll make a response to something that's coming in that should give you a degree of protection. Um, the negative side effect, um, which is the sore arm, um, everybody's going to experience that. Sorry. Um, it doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> I get, and then building on that, um, Bill, we've got a question from Fatima around um, if someone does get a, you know, a side effect from the vaccine, is there, can there be other reasons for that? So if you have a, an unhealthy lifestyle or an underlying health condition, are you more prone to get um, more side effects? And, or is, you know, is that something that can impact it as well? Um. The only sort of unhealthy lifestyle thing that one can think of is this virus, um, it targets what's called ACE2. It's a receptor that, that's found around the body. Um, but I can't think of un underlying health conditions. So diabetes is, a, is an issue. Um, heart disease is an issue as well. So basically any underlying condition. In terms of making profoundly negative effects to the vaccine, it's probably not going to be the vaccine molecule itself or the virus itself. It might be what it's injected with. So my son, for example, will have to be really careful because he has an egg allergy and a lot of vaccine preparations are stabilized with something called ovalbumin which is the protein that's in egg white. So when you fry an egg, that's the, the white bit is the albumin. So if Peter was injected in the arm uh, with um, a vaccine construct suspended in a albumin, he'd be in the emergency room 20 minutes later because of an allergic reaction. So for something like that, you need to make sure your GP is aware of any allergies that you have that might be problematic. Uh, autoimmune disease, um, some people might give an adverse reaction as a result of that. Um, and again, your general practitioner or your local physicians should be, should be aware of that. And then we have a question, another question from Dean around the, one of the new variants of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, is there any truth that if we use a double face mask that, that can help reduce the infection rate? Is there, is there any data I guess from a non-scientist point of view, I can I can see that there, you know, maybe benefits to 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 having a double mask. I've seen some people um, who are, you know, even in the UK who wear the the sort of medical mask and then a, a cloth mask over that. But is there any supportive data yet to to sort of you know back that up? I mean, anecdotally, um, I, I take the view that you know two two layers of protection are better than one. Uh, but remember, the mask is there to protect everybody else from you, not you from everybody else. Um, but it will reduce uh, the likelihood of encountering a lot of virus. I mean, we do know that, you know, any, any viral infection, how bad it gets depends on the initial dose that you get. And we're talking angels on a pinhead here. So if you imagine a, a, a pin uh, and the little top bit that you put your thumb on, the number of viruses you can fit on there are enormous. Um, so these droplets carry lots of infectious particles. So for the new variant, I think we're going to cope with those with um, those um, multivalent vaccines as time goes forward. So we'll be assembling those along the same line as Gardasil for human papillomavirus. So there's no scientific data for two um, masks doing any more good. But common sense tells you it's probably not a bad thing. If the first layer doesn't get it, the second layer might. 
Great. We've got two more sort of, I would say, vaccine related questions, and then we will, um, unless anyone's getting anything else, I will sort of pass over to Alfin and, and ask some of the more general questions. So we actually have a question from Matteo, who um, I think is actually a current student with yeah. us, it looks like, in the, the MRES and Biomedical Science. So he has a very specific question around enhanced respiratory disease post-vaccination and is asking um, for your views on this. And um, I'm conscious we are starting to get a bit tight on time. So if we could perhaps even do a, a short answer and then Matteo, um, we'd be more than happy for um, to arrange for you and, and Bill to maybe have a catch up um, offline as well if you've got more detailed questions. Okay. So Matthew and I are old pals. We, we, we've batted questions back and forward on, on this for a bit. So what Matteo is asking here is the vaccines will make antibody, yeah? So that protects you against the virus and that all sounds good. But in Southeast Asia, you're aware that there's a problem with antibodies and virus disease and that's with dengue. So if you make an immune response to dengue, it can sometimes make the, uh, the second infection worse. It can even kill you. So that's because the antibodies help the virus to infect cells. Um, Matthew, I think, I think we've got enough data now from the first, I guess it's six to eight weeks now that vaccines have been given, certainly in the UK, and data are coming in from those and have been no instances of which I'm aware of what the broad catch-all term is antibody-dependent enhancement. So people who are getting the vaccines are doing well and there are no reports I'm aware of that suggest the vaccine is generating an immune response that facilitates more infection and exacerbates disease. And that's the short answer. So I think we'd know if the data were going in the wrong direction. I haven't, I'm not aware of any and I'm not, I don't think this is going to be a, a big problem with the uh, vaccines that are out there at the moment. Thank you. And then we have a Thank final you. question um, on, on vaccines, certainly from Mima. And Mima, please feel free to interrupt me because you're the, there's some technical language in here. Um, I am not a scientist, so if I, if I get this wrong, please feel free to jump in and ask the question directly. So Mima is asking about RBD, I G test results and her laboratory, or um, sorry, I think her, sorry if that's wrong, laboratory in Jakarta have already had their second injection is not high enough as um, so it's coming in around five to 10 units per milliliter. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think this is the case, Bill? Is this just because the Sino vaccine simulates um, various reactions? Um, so how can we know that particular vaccine is good enough? And Mima, apologies if I have I hope I've I hope I've asked that question correctly um, with my non-scientific knowledge. Okay, I, I mean that, that's that's a great question. So um, for everybody else on the call, RBD means receptor binding domain, and the Sinovac um, vaccine will certainly provoke responses to that. The only thing that pops into my mind, and I'm I'm happy to have a chat with you offline on this, um, Mima, is the Sinovac vaccine is a, a whole virus, okay? So you grow up the virus, you kill it with beta prolactone, you formulate it and you, you inject it into the subject. So that's going to make a massive immune response against everything. Um, so it might be that you're making lots of IgGs against everything other than the receptor binding domain and not just IgG. So in, in and that's fair enough, you, you'll still have enough receptor binding domain antibody to work. But within, within your lab, and you might not be able to answer this for, for lab specific reasons, but just to throw a thought into your mind, in your lab, do you do neutralization assays? That is to say assays that show that the serum stops infection of target cells in the test tube. And it might be that the patients don't have very high levels of anti-receptor binding domain antibodies, but they've got really good neutralizing antibodies against other parts of the spike protein and indeed other components of the viral envelope. But you're getting responses there. 
It depends when you took them. If that if you took those samples at 14 days, that's probably just about right. If you took them in another week or another two weeks, you might find the levels are higher. So part of the reason might be the window from vaccination to assay might be the problem. But Mima, I'm happy to pick this up with you guys offline for a chat on that. Because um, I know I know time is, as it always does, marches against us. Thank you, Bill, and thank you everyone for your questions. They've been some some really interesting questions, yeah. and and as they know, I've certainly learned a lot this morning. Um, I don't know if um, any sort of final questions that are particularly for Bill on this topic, or if not, um, we will start to sort of pick up perhaps. Um, well, I guess, um, Pat Kendra, will we, will we pass over to some of the alumni? Do you want to have a, a chat with some of our alumni um, who are with us today? And then we can take some of the more general questions as well. Uh, sure, now can we, can we start answering uh, the general questions about subjects and yes, anything else? Can. Yeah. Um, no, um, thank you. Bill, I don't know what the rest of your day looks like. If you want to stay around for the rest of the session, you're obviously more than welcome, but I know you are a, a busy man. Um, so if you have to go, then thank you very much um, for, for giving us your time this morning and for, for talking to, to the students. I'm, I'm really grateful and I, I think everyone else will, will be grateful for that insight today as well. Okay, thanks Shona. I'll, I'll stick around for a quarter of an hour in case there's any questions that bubble up on the biomedical sciences programmes. That I could answer for you. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go back up through the, the sort of more general questions. Um, Henry, are you happy for me to still go through these? Or are you wanting to, yes. to take over as, as moderator? No, carry on. I'm, I'm happy for you so to. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to test Alf and then I'm going to make sure he's he's been paying attention. <laughs> um, so Alf, and we have a question from Zaki who is um, he's a. Uh, working in student fisheries in Indonesia um, and is currently taking a course on processing fisheries product engineering. Um, are there any sort of fisheries related master's programmes offered at Glasgow um, that we could perhaps recommend um, looking particularly at processing fisheries products? Let me check on the chat first. Well, what's the programme again, uh, So we're looking at something around processing fisheries. Um, Uh, I don't think you have processing fisheries product. Uh, in no, I was just I, 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 I can jump in and, and sort of add, we we don't have anything sort of directly related to to fisheries. Actually, we have a couple of programs around sustainable water environments, um, yeah. where there is an element of sort of fisheries um, sort of covered within that. But it sounds like you've already um, taken it and sort of studies to, to a fairly specialist level. There are a couple of other universities. Um, that I'm aware of that offer um, sort of more specialist programmes um, within Scotland as well. So, um, for example, the University of Stirling has, has some really interesting programmes around fisheries and aquaculture. So perhaps you can pick up with the IBEC team um, after this session and, and look at other options that might be um, a slightly better fit for you. And if you do end up at one of the other Scottish universities, then please do pop through and, and see us at Glasgow if you if you do end up coming through but it's not our sort of um, really specialist area um, as I say we just have that more general um, sustainable water environments program um, as well so um, just have... yeah of course Alvin yes uh, we also had the similar inquiry I think last week and that's also focused on the fisheries program and it turns out that after counseling with me, then the person is really interested in uh, food security. So probably that will be also another consideration program that you want to see, uh, Mas. So just in case yeah, you want to- discuss actually, the, the food security you know. program again is something that is, is for others who may be looking in a similar field. It sounds like Zaki has quite sort of a, a specialist focus, but sort of the food security and the sustainable water environments are the two programs that we have for those of you who are, who are interested in that more general area. Um, we've got a question from Albert who's looking to apply for the MSc Media Management Programme. Um, so great option there, Albert. It's a really popular programme, um, really sort of bridging, um, pulling together expertise from two of our, our academic schools. We've got the 
the, the College of Arts and the Adam Smith Business School who teach on that programme. Um, and Albert's looking to find out a little bit more about the academic and networking opportunities on campus. Um, so again, in addition to the, the lectures that you, you have from your, your own department, is it possible to engage with lecturers from a different department and network with them? Do you want me to? I can take that. I give that one again, um, Alvin, if, if you want. Is it? And, and yes, Albert. The answer is absolutely um, cross sort of disciplinary, interdisciplinary studies and research is something that we're really keen to engage with um, and encourage our, our students to do at the university. So, you're for most of your program, and actually the program you're doing is a really good example of that because you are actually going to be taught by people from two different schools already. So you're getting taught across two different departments. Um, so the master's program is a, a primarily taught um, program. So you have nine months of classes, then you do your own research for the three months at the end of, of your master's program. Um, there are opportunities throughout the academic year for you to um, network with other students on different programmes as well as meet the staff from, from different programmes as well. If you have a particular area that you're interested in, then we would absolutely encourage you to, to sort of reach out and to talk about any sort of research or um, suggestions that you have. So the best advice I can give any of you who are thinking about studying overseas is the university is essentially yours to explore while you're while you're there for that that year whether or three years if you're here for a PhD and um, we want to hear from you the academics want to hear from you and um, I think the biggest regret a lot of students have is they don't take advantage of all those opportunities when they're they're studying overseas and you know really making sure that you um, engage with the networking opportunities um, attend events that are happening on campus. So again, we've we've had a lot of different um, online events running this year um, from different departments. And, and sometimes people will hear something in an academic presentation that's not directly related to their own work that perhaps sparks an idea or makes them think about um, research or an idea that they've not previously thought about as well. If I can add something, Shona. Yes, please um, do. It is, it is actually quite clear at the, um, for, for Albert, if you see the website of media management, it, there are three schools um, involving on the program. So the cultural policy, um, Adam Smith Business School, as well as the School of Law. So obviously you'll be able to have a network with any of the lectures from those three schools. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Henry. I was forgetting that law teach on that program as well. Well remembered. Mm. Um. Alvin, I don't know. There's more questions here from Ian around um, that applicate. So we look at the requirements for doctorate degree. So I don't know if you would like to talk Ian and others through the process of applying for a PhD, which is obviously quite often a bit different to applying for a top master's program. Yes, uh, I will try to answer that and you can advise of the process. Uh, we always recommend the uh, strong candidate to find from the list of the supervisor from our website. It's, it's very easy to follow because uh, the Latvian University has the, the list of the supervisor accordingly to the expertise. So, uh, Yori, if you want to have some guidelines, you can just simply email me and I can give you the guidance for the, all the steps from the beginning to the last. And also your research proposal as well. If you just, it, it may be helpful, Alvin, just what we've got, because I think there's quite a few people in the call today who are interested in PhD, so we can certainly follow up directly with people, but if you maybe just want to talk through that or find a supervisor process for, for those who are on the call today. Okay, so I just read my slide, I mean, the from the website. Yeah, just as I say, just um, if you can talk through how the, the find a supervisor process works. All right, okay. So from the research menu on the website, you can just simply click on the search for the supervisor and just put the um, some topic that you really want to pursue for your research proposal. So it will be appear uh, all the uh, expertise or academics uh, from those from those lists. 
So just simply email them until you can just finally get some answer, yes, or you need to upgrade or I need to update about the research proposal. Then you can just start with the application uh, through IBEC. Um, if I can add on something about PhD applications um, to everyone who is thinking about applying for PhD, um, based on our experience, we always advise applying PhD, it's like imagining yourself is about to get married. If you want to get married, you're going to have to make sure that the university you're going to stick with uh, do have something in common to what you're going to do for research. So uh, to simplify the things, we always advise everyone. One is that uh, prepare your personal uh, uh, personal statement, all your plan and everything, plus your research proposal. After you have your idea of research proposals, as Pa Alvin said, look up on the website, um, see those list of supervisor and see if anyone probably um, match to what you're going to do. Then um, later on in, in, in details, you'll be talking about the methodology of your research and everything else. If all in all the same, or you, you have something in common, then that's it. You have a potential supervisor applications then can be processed or if you need assistance um, you know you can we we will put the address uh, the email address of pa alfin again and us you can also email pa alfin um, seek for guidance and if you want to get details guidance you can also email me uh, then we'll guide you through on how to apply for a phd at glasgow I think that would be better, yeah, but okay. Yeah, that, that's, I love the analogy of comparing it to finding a, uh, finding a, a <laughs> husband or a wife. And I think, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. It, it. It's not, it's not like applying for a postgraduate or undergraduate program. There's not a, a PhD program there. You, you are your PhD program. You create your PhD program. Um, what I would say is with your research proposal, it doesn't have to be perfect when you um, yeah. reach out to try and identify a supervisor. It just needs to be enough information for, you know, the academic staff to look at it and say, yes, this looks like a subject area that I could, I could supervise. This aligns to other research that is going on, or I know somebody else who's a really good fit for this they will then help you to ref you know they can then help you to refine that more formally um, and also your phd proposal develops during your studies as well you know i know a lot of students who've what their initial proposal looks like it changes as they they go through that research proposal but it does require i, I think it, the best advice i can give is there is more effort required at the start for an application because you've got to have that initial suggestion um, and 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 team can help you to to do that of course um but there isn't a sort of phd directly that you can ap apply for although what you can apply for is um we have some mres programs which are a four-year option for a number of degrees where you do one year top masters leading directly into your phd and you work on your phd during that um top um, or the sort of research master's element part of it as well. Um, I think that's covered a couple of the questions that were coming through. There's quite a few around PhD. Um, so, and there's a couple of scholarships. So what I would say is for scholarships for PhD, there are limited options. Um, again, because they're not top programmes, we don't have set university scholarships. Well, and again, one of the advantages of reaching out to the supervisors in advance is they are often aware of funding that you can potentially apply for. Sometimes they will have um, funding themselves for, for certain research projects that they can direct you to, um, as well as direct you to some external funding opportunities as well. But we we have very scholarships for PhD sort of offered directly by the university. Um, I know that in Indonesia, where you're fairly fortunate in that you do have quite a lot of government support 
PhD studies as well. So again, it's helpful in your application to highlight um, sort of funding that you might have as well. Um, in, that you've, if you've already been able to secure funding, um, it's helpful for us to know that in that application as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for PhDs, actually quite specific. Um, if you're talking about scholarships, we always advise everyone, if you are a lecturer, there are several opportunities for you to apply for PhD scholarships. There are Budi, um, LPDP, or scholarships for teachers. Um, so that includes lectures as well. Um, yep, very limited in the UK. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, Shona and Alvin, I have a direct questions about the scholarships for women in STEM. Um, so those students who have applied, they have got an offer. Uh, they are ladies, obviously, so they know the uh, basic requirement. Um, when they have got their offer, they want to apply for the scholarship. They'll fill up the form on the website. It's like a Google form. And do they have to do anything else, including the deposit that they have to pay? No, so that particular scholarship, so we're really excited to be working with the British Council this year to offer five fully funded scholarships for women in STEM um, related to climate change and energy. Um, so once the students have received an offer letter, um, they can just complete the online application for the scholarship, which is um, fairly um, easy. It's not too complicated. Yep. Then what will happen is when the deadline for the scholarship is in the, the beginning of April, um, 4th of the 7th, I can't remember, the date's just changed. Um, so the, the, the after that, the what will happen is the university and British Council will make a, a decision. Um, so they will assess the different applications. There's no interview um, or anything required. We'll make the decision based on your, on your application. Um, and we aim to get back to, to students to let them know if they've been successful no later in the end of May 2021 for that particular programme. Um, what I would say is our admissions turnaround um, is currently around about 28 working days. So um, if people are thinking about applying for that award, we would encourage you to submit an application um, as soon as possible. Um, and you can flag that to myself or Alfin if you've applied and have been waiting for maybe a couple of weeks, we will see if we can hurry that application up for you to give you enough time to apply for the scholarship separately as well. Um, what I've been recommending people do, um, Mahendra, is that they draft their application for the, the scholarship while they're waiting for their offer letter, just so they've got, um, their, if they do get, an, if they, by the time they get an offer, it might be quite close to the, the deadline for applying. So it just means they're not rushing the scholarship application. Right, so do they have, do they still have to pay for the deposit? No, um, if so, if they are successful in getting the scholarship, they they're not the deposit will be um, removed. They don't have to to pay any deposit um, if they okay. if they get the cool. something. Uh, once once the student already applied, so the turnaround for the application, as Shona said, is about two weeks. Once the LOA is being issued, then uh, sorry, Alvin, it's twenty eight days. It's closer to four weeks. So just to be to be clear on that one, it is is a is a, a twenty eight day turnaround. Yes, just, just making sure that the applicant uh, really prepare about the personal statement, but yeah, so personal statement is the important one that will be assessed for the final decision on the scholarship. Just recently, yep. I had a meeting with the British Council, so they also raised up about this this issue as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, but very good advice. Very good advice. Erika, you raise your hand. Do you have any questions, Erika? Mbak Erika, angkat tangan. Mungkin ada pertanyaan khusus, Mbak Erika. Silahkan. No? Okay. Um, Pak Alvin. Can we speak to the alumni now? Okay, nah, ini alumni-alumninya mana nih? Coba di absen dulu. Uh, 
Shona and Bill, I'm so sorry, I'll speak a bit in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, we'll, about, uh, we will talk to alumni to share their stories during their stay in Glasgow before. Um, Mbak Anita, ada ya? Ada. Um, ah. Oke, ada. Um, Mas Atwi ada. Anggo, Mas Anggo. Belum. Mas Anggo ada ya? Iya, halo Pak. Halo. Nah, ini yang 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 mau ditanyain ini uh, yang mau ditanyain pertama adalah satu hal nih. Siapa dulu ya? Dari Mbak Anita coba deh. mengenai Adam Smith Business School. Dulu di Adam Smith Business School, ambil program apa, terus dapat scholarship-nya apa, jumlahnya berapa, selama di Glasgow jalan-jalan kemana? <laughs> Wah, itu banyak banget pertanyaannya sekaligus. <laughs> Oke, okay, um, perkenalkan nama saya Anita, dan saya di Adam Smith Business School, itu dulu ngambil uh, International Human Resource Management and Development. Jadi, uh, basically, it's about HR. Dan uh, di situ kebetulan dapat Adam Smith Business School Excellence Scholarship yang besarnya uh, 5.000 pounds. Uh, itu sebenarnya sangat lumayan sih untuk bisa uh, motong biaya kuliahnya gitu. Walaupun sebenarnya bisa lebih bisa misalnya apply uh, government scholarship juga mungkin teman-teman yang mau uh, sekolah S2 ataupun S3 bisa coba untuk apply uh, government scholarship cuman kalau kebetulan waktu itu uh, saya memang applying-nya untuk self funded dan uh, scholarship yang itu thank you Pak Alvin <laughs> terus selama di Glasgow wah ya yeah. sebisa mungkin lah gitu explore the city terus um, karena nggak terlalu bisa jalan yang jauh ya karena ada restriction juga sempat karena lockdown dan lain-lainnya tapi sebisa mungkin uh, ya explore the city terus explore the Glencoe ke arah utara terus ke beberapa kota juga seperti Oban um, terus wah macam-macam sih kalau disebutin sini lima hari mungkin sesinya <laughs> Oke, okay. ini sekarang kan lagi musim sepedahan, musim olahraga ya. Waktu hmm. di Glasgow eh, sering lari juga di dalam kota atau sering sepedahan? Soalnya saya ingat jalanan di Glasgow itu di kota Glasgow kan ada yang nanjaknya curam tuh. Saya jalan setengah jalan aja, saya nggak hmm. sanggup. Kalau saya sih ke- lebih suka jalan ya, uh, Pak. Hmm. Jadi uh, saya kemana-mana memang kalau selama di bawah satu jam itu saya selalu jalan kemana-mana gitu. kecuali hujan atau kecuali uh, the weather is not supportive saya lebih ambil subway atau uh, public transport kalau untuk sport alias sepedaan misalnya atau jogging itu kadang-kadang jogging di Kelvin Grove Park itu enak banget sih uh, karena di situ juga viewnya oke okay. apalagi kalau weathernya uh, bagus banget gitu banyak yang dilihat kayak ada kolam angsa terus ada uh, patung-patung, terus jembatannya, itu juga banyak banget yang bisa dilihat di situ. Kalau sepedaan, uh, kan, saya pernah sih pakai next uh, kayak ini uh, next bike, next bike ya kalau nggak salah ya namanya. Ya, uh, ya next bike itu saya pernah sekali doang sih, tapi bukan untuk sport sih. Teman-teman yang lain mungkin ada juga yang beli sepeda atau beli sepeda second untuk mereka pakai keliling-keliling kota gitu. Ah, Oke, okay. kita pindah ke Mbak Oki. Mbak Oki, ya, boleh saya, cerita Mbak Oki Indra. pengalamannya? Oh ya, uh, saya di Glasgow ambil media management. Tadi ada yang bertanya tentang program tersebut dan benar kata Pak Hendra kita uh, program itu sebenarnya kolaborasi dari uh, beberapa fakultas dalam tanda kutip, jadi emang uh, kita terpapar dengan uh, beberapa site dari uh, marketing, karena ada kerjasama dengan Adam Smith Business School juga, sama ada beberapa course yang uh, menarik yang bisa diambil di akhir uh, kuliah, kayak yang saya ikuti itu adalah uh, entrepreneurship, terus sempat diajak diajarin juga untuk uh, pitching ngalala startup gitu. Um, Saya ke sana di dapat funding dari LPDP. Jadi uh, dan saya juga dibantu sama teman-teman dari IBEC, uh, IBEC Indonesia. Uh, ada Mbak Rita, saya masih ingat. Terima kasih Mbak Rita waktu itu supportnya 
Terima kasih Halo, Mbak. Halo, sehat-sehat kan Mbak? Iya. <laughs> ya, setelah lima tahun sekian, ternyata kita bertemu lagi di ya. ini. Thank you banget uh, Mbak Rita atas supportnya ya. dulu. Uh, jadi Mbak Rita ini yang memberikan guidance kepada saya on how to secure uh, LOA, terus juga yang uh, apa sangat disiplin nagih-nagihin saya ke, uh, apa kayak uh, paspornya belum, ininya belum, itunya belum, karena kebetulan uh, saya ketika mendaftar beasiswa saya sambil kerja dan pekerjaan saya saat itu sangat intens. Jadi uh, thank you uh, udah dipolisiin dalam tanda kutip sama Mbak uh, Rita. Uh, and then uh, saya sebenarnya ada beberapa nggak banyak banget sih a few uh, LOAs yang saya secure waktu itu uh, dan uh, apa saya mungkin cukup beruntung karena di zaman itu uh, LPDP itu membolehkan kita uh, apa belum dapat LOA tapi udah bisa secure scholarship dan I decided to uh, use the scholarship to University of Glasgow dan itu merupakan keputusan yang uh, sangat uh, turns out sangat baik karena Uh, apa secara akademik saya mendapatkan uh, kurikulum yang sangat sesuai dengan passion saya dan uh, apa uh, kurikulumnya juga dikurasi sedemikian rupa uh, jadi saya belajar media itu benar-benar sangat uh, relevan sangat mengikuti apa market trends yang ada saat ini dan uh, perkuliahannya juga semua sangat research based jadi semua profesor dan dosen-dosen di sana uh, itu itu memfamiliarkan kita dengan uh, riset, terus juga uh, sangat ketat dalam hal uh, plagiarism. Jadi uh, apa itu merupakan uh, academic experience yang uh, luar biasa deh buat saya. Dan uh, saya juga aktif di PPI Glasgow. Uh, uh, di era saya kita pertama kali mengadakan uh, apa ya kayak sharing session kayak call gitu jarak jauh di zaman zoom meeting atau google hangout belum populer kita udah menggunakan uh, memfasilitasi teman-teman yang akan masuk untuk memberikan uh, guidance pre departure briefing lah istilahnya gitu and then uh, saya juga ingat di zaman kami lah PPI yang kami itu uh, kita mendorong agar uh, University of Glasgow memberikan uh, fasilitas berupa musola dan sangat welcome sekali dari uh, apa manajemen kampus karena mereka uh, menomor satukan yang namanya diversity, inclusivity dan seterusnya sehingga uh, apa satu semester sebelum kami lulus uh, di library kita udah diberikan uh, fasilitas untuk beribadah dan juga di uh, di gedung main, camp, main campus yang jadi uh, apa kayak Harry Potter itu nah, itu juga um, ya jadi uh, thank you untuk IBEC thank you juga untuk University of Glasgow Pak Alvin saya tahu sangat uh, antusias uh, apa sangat sabar melayani pertanyaan-pertanyaan untuk uh, calon apa prospektif prospektif students maupun juga dari para alumni good luck untuk semuanya Mbak Oki satu pertanyaan Mbak Oki Yes. Tempat paling favorit satu aja di Glasgow selama kuliah apa? Kelvin Grove Park. <laughs> oh, ini standar ini jawabannya. Standar. Mas Anggu, yeah. Saya yakin Mas Anggu juga sama jawabannya mungkin. <laughs> mungkin Pak salah satunya kalau bicara tempat tentang um, tempat favorit kayaknya di Glasgow every ini ya every place is one of my favorite places gitu. Hmm. Kurang lebihnya begitu. Halo semua salam kenal saya Anggu kebetulan. Silahkan Mas, dilanjutkan perkenalannya Mas, kuliah di mana, dulu di Glasgow, jalan-jalan aja, bolos mulu, atau <laughs> ngapain? Kebetulan uh, saya kuliah di University of, uh, University of uh, Glasgow, uh, berkat bantuannya Pak Alvin, thank you Pak Alvin. Um, saya kuliah di <laughs> saya kuliah di jurusan Infections Biology, uh, jadi kalau tadi ngomongin tentang vaksin, ngomongin tentang infection, ngomongin tentang coronavirus, Uh, pas saya lulus kebetulan lagi hangat-hangatnya tentang coronavirus jadi uh, belum sempat mengalami secara detail tadi adalah salah satu juga yang uh, cukup baik ya gitu uh, mendapatkan knowledge baru um, kalau berbicara tentang jalan-jalan um, kebetulan di glas di kuliah di Glasgow ini punya kesempatan jalan-jalan ke semua nations uh, dan kebetulan saya uh, berusaha banget untuk jalan-jalan ke empat nation tersebut apa aja mas? Uh, saya ke, ke England hampir semuanya, kemudian ke Scotland pasti ya karena Scotland one of the best places, one of the best country mungkin ya. Um, 
ke Well sama ke aduh satu lagi mana ya? Island apa ke Northern Island? Northern Island ya. Okay. Itu kalau jalan-jalan terus kapan kuliahnya Mas Anggo? Ini dia yang menarik di Glasgow uh, karena kita sebetulnya sebagai students itu bisa memanage waktu sih sebetulnya Pak. Hmm. Jadi pintar-pintar kita aja uh, sebetulnya di Term ketiga itu kan sebetulnya sibuk ya masuk term kedua ke term ketiga itu sebetulnya sibuk sekali. Nah di bagian itu kita nggak bisa tuh jalan-jalan. Tapi di term sebelumnya kita bisa banget untuk uh, ambil waktu untuk jalan-jalan. Jadi tinggal manage aja bareng-bareng sama teman-teman. Yang penting kita kalau pengalaman akademik tadi udah diceritain sama Mbak Oki, sama Mbak Anita. Kebetulan saya juga uh, uh, salah satu over dia dari, dari LPDP seperti Mbak Oki. Uh, intinya kita tetap bertanggung jawab dengan uh, segala akademiknya dan I'm sure ya uh, for uh, all Indonesian uh, students di sana pasti bertanggung jawab. Um, cuman yang menarik yaitu harus ambil kesempatan untuk jalan-jalan untuk melihat dunia lebih, untuk melihat hal-hal yang lebih menarik lagi. Mas satu hal Mas tadi Gimana? kan bilang katanya selama kuliah itu kan ada intensnya di semester 3 ya, pada saat mulai menulis desertasi ya. Mm-hmm. Dari semester 1, semester 2-nya pakai sistem SKS. Kebetulan kalau di uh, di jurusan saya, semester 1 itu kebetulan sangat padat, Pak, sebetulnya. Jadi challenge, the, the most challenges uh, ini ya, um, semester kalau menurut saya atau termnya, itu di term pertamanya gitu. Sebetulnya jadi uh, ya karena mungkin kita juga perlu adaptasi dengan sistem biasanya kita belajar di Indonesia dengan sistem mungkin SKS. Bagi saya nggak SKS ya Pak. <laughs> Harus bekerja keras <laughs> sepertinya. Uh, di UK juga begitu. We have to prepare uh, dari yang mungkin kita nggak ngerti uh, gimana sih caranya approach nulis essay dengan baik uh, untuk uh, kalau tadi Mbak Oki sempat bilang di sana uh, research base untuk uh, untuk uh, studinya ya kebetulan jurusan saya juga research based jadi bahkan yang researchnya ongoing gitu udah dipresentasiin sama lecturenya jadi itu buat kita betul-betul uh, melek sama research gitu kemudian uh, betul-betul uh, harus betul-betul update dengan itu jadi kalau ketinggalan sedikit gitu ya buat yang mungkin apalagi saya ada gap year sebelum ke master uh, betul-betul harus memperhatikan harus uh, istilahnya senggol kanan senggol kiri pak jadi memang tapi itu betul-betul enjoy banget, betul-betul super enjoy, gitu okay. ya. Jadi kalau misalnya dibilang uh, stres nggak, uh, nggak juga, karena ternyata senikmat itu belajar di sana gitu. Waduh, udah sampai senikmat itu, Mas. Ngomong-ngomong, Mas Raginya udah ada belum nih ya, Mas Ragi? Ragi, Ragi belum datang nih Pak kayaknya. Belum. Kalau gitu saya mau tanya ke Mbak Anita lagi. Kalau tadi Mbak Mbak Oki sama Mas Anggo sudah menjawab, kan katanya kalau Mas Anggo belajarnya nikmat. Kalau Mbak Oki tadi juga seru. Kalau di Adam Smith Business School gimana Mbak? Mbak Anita, boleh cerita dikit nggak? Um, sebenarnya saya bisa dibilang sangat bangga uh, bisa masuk atau jadi bagian dari keluarga besar Adam Smith Business School karena um, Adam Smith Business School sendiri merupakan salah satu fakultas yang paling besar di uh, University of Glasgow dengan student yang notabene terbanyak gitu dan di situ kita bisa lihat uh, diversity-nya tuh kerasa banget cuman memang perlu diperhatikan untuk beberapa program di Adam Smith Business School itu dominannya ada nationality tertentu yang dominan dari uh, setiap kelasnya. Nah, contohnya waktu di kelas saya itu memang banyak banget students yang dari China. Memang bisa dapat uh, teman sih dari negara-negara lain itu dia banyak banget dan uh, orang-orangnya itu juga professional minded. Dan itu yang saya senang, itu kayak making me open-minded tentang apa sih perkembangan yang ada di dunia ini, dan apa sih fokus-fokusnya mereka di usia mereka itu dari negara-negara lain. Apalagi when we talk about uh, business, atau we talk about management, apalagi misalnya di program saya, we talk about human. Bagaimana kita uh, mengikuti perkembangan, uh, preferensi, dan interest dari masing-masing orang, dan uh, tenaga kerja itu juga berubah, uh, bursa kerja itu juga berubah. Itu semuanya kayak 
saya diajarkan untuk bisa memprediksi um, hal-hal yang mungkin terjadi, jadi mengantisipasi. Itu yang uh, membuat saya suka banget belajar di University of Glasgow, because the people make us think beyond. gitu Kita dilatih untuk think beyond dari apa yang ada sekarang. Itu sih. Oke. Okay. Um, tapi kalau dipersingkat nih ya Mbak Anita, kalau ditanya nih, sekolahnya selama di Adam Smith Business School, praktikal nggak? Uh, untungnya pada saat saya di sana itu masih sempat merasakan pengalaman yang kelas uh, session, maksudnya bukan cuma fully online seperti uh, angkatan yang sekarang. Uh, so I can say it's quite practical. Jadi banyak banget komponen-komponen di mana kita harus presentasi, di mana kita harus mempersiapkan suatu proyek, dan di mana kita harus uh, bahkan kita membuat sendiri program kalau di HR kan ada kayak training, development dan lain-lainnya kita disuruh buat program itu sendiri dengan semua pertimbangannya dan termasuk kontak ke perusahaannya juga jadi um, banyak komponen praktikal sih untuk uh, angkatan saya waktu itu oke okay. jadi uh, pada prinsipnya kalau saya boleh bilang yang digaris bawah adalah menyenangkan ketemu teman-teman baru dari negara lain yang open minded membuat kita juga lebih open minded begitu ya nah uh, mbak Oki masih ada ya? Oki mbak Oki masih ada mas Anggo saya mau tanya dulu mas Anggo ya masih pak oh ada nah ini dia Mbak Oki tadi mengatakan satu kata yang sangat menarik untuk saya dan dan uh, saya juga mau saya juga mau uh, tegaskan juga kata inklusif. Jadi kalau berbicara mengenai Inggris mengenai Glasgow inklusif bagi semua orang semua itu disambut dengan tangan terbuka semuanya tidak ada yang dibeda-bedakan semuanya tidak ada yang merasa di anak dirikan. Nah, kita bicara yang paling hal sederhana yang terkadang suka ditanyakan oleh teman-teman kebetulan yang beragama Muslim. Mbak Oki di sana makan gampang ya, Mbak? Gampang, Pak. Banyak provider makanan halal. Oke. Okay. Uh, makannya apa, Mbak? Eh, uh, macam-macam somai, sate padang. Loh. Loh. <laughs> Itu sih teman-teman Loh. Indonesia pelajar Indonesia biasanya banyak yang support kita yang istri-istrinya pada uh, apa istrinya masih PhD pada bikin. Tapi generally uh, mudah kok mendapatkan bahan makanan maupun makanan jadi yang uh, halal. Oke. Okay. Kenapa yang disebut sate padang sama siomay ya? Emang benar <laughs> di sana makan siomay? Serius, Pak. Benar. Di angkatan juga. saya, di angkatan saya enak-enak makanan Indonesianya. Sate Padang juga ada? Ada, Pak. Sate Padang. Okay. Oh. Bukan apa sih, waktu tahun 2006, waktu kita berkunjung, saya berkunjung ke Bomes itu, eh, kita sempat bikin ngetes gitu kan, tahun segitu itu kita mau ngetes bikin martabak, bisa nggak ya di Inggris? Eh, ternyata dapat semua barangnya. Akhirnya jadi martabak. Tadi Mbak Oki ya yang bilang sering makan martabak di Inggris. Iya, Pak. Jagoan deh kalau PhD pokoknya banyak ini uh, explore resep-resep Indonesia jadi nggak perlu khawatir asal ini aja apa uh, keep connected with uh, PPI students. Amin. Mas Anggo juga sama ya Mas Anggo sempat ngerasain puasa di Inggris nggak Mas Anggo? Sempat Pak kebetulan. Uh, nah, sama. Pas puasa Sampai. itu jatuhnya di musim panas atau bukan? Sepertinya di musim panas ya, karena kita puasa hampir 18 jam waktu itu. Kuat, Mas. Halo. Uh, iya, kami merasakan uh, puasa pada saat itu, uh, kurang lebih mungkin di musim panas, itu sekitar 18 jam. Kuat nggak selama itu? Ada bolongnya nggak? Saya pikir awalnya waktu di Indonesia, aduh saya nggak kuat nih puasa 18 jam nih. Hmm. Aduh, batal nih gitu ya. Begitu udah sampai sana karena temannya support dan uh, weather-nya juga mendukung banget sebetulnya. Jadi kuat-kuat aja Pak ternyata. Iya. Sebetulnya kalau di sana itu panasnya itu nggak lembab ya. Cuman Betul. saking ademnya itu kadang-kadang sebetulnya nggak adem. Musim panas itu mungkin agak lebih lembab ketimbang musim dingin. 
kalau puasa di musim dingin itu jauh lebih kering. Walaupun dia puasanya cepat, cuma 6 jam udah selesai, enggak 6 jam juga sih, 8 jam paling, enggak sampai. Hmm. Tapi kering sekali. Akhirnya itu yang lebih cepat haus musim panas, kemarin masih oke okay ya, Mas? Ya? Masih, masih oke okay banget, Pak. Uh... Awalnya mikir, aduh nggak kuat nih 18 jam, tapi ternyata setelah dilalui ternyata enak juga puasa 18 jam. Seru. Ketemu, uh, jadi agak ngebut gitu. Uh, tiba-tiba maghrib, tiba-tiba tarawih, tiba-tiba udah mau uh, ini lagi. Baru makan, tiba-tiba udah harus sahur gitu. Itu seru okay. banget sih. Nah, terus bukanya pakai gorengan juga? Iya dong Pak. Kebetulan se- seperti tadi Mbak Oki bilang ya. Kebetulan saya di sana hobi masak Pak. Jadi... Ketika berangkat ke Glasgow, tiba-tiba jadi chef aja gitu. Tapi kebanyakan juga jadi terinspirasi sama uh, ibu-ibu yang di sana memang uh, memprovide ini juga ya, provide uh, makanan juga. Jadi kalau buat masalah makanan mah mau dari bakso, mie ayam, sate padang, sayur asam, semuanya ada. Jangan khawatir. Ini kenapa yang disebutin semua makanan Indonesia ya? Betul, betul. Uh, tunggu dulu. Jadi selama di Glasgow makanannya bukan burger, bukan makan fish and chip, bukan makan yang lain. Makan Pak, tapi hanya bagian kecil aja. Kalau kita lagi kemana kan kita nggak mungkin masak dan mendapatkan makanan Indonesia secara mudah ya. Tapi kalau di Glasgownya sendiri, aduh nggak uh, kita pilih prefer untuk makanan Indonesia sih kalau saya. Kalau saya kebetulan ya. Tetap cari nasi ya. Cari nasi betul Pak. Ya. apalagi dingin-dingin. Mbak Oki dah tadi ketawa geli terus pasti ingat waktu lima tahun yang lalu beliau di Glasgow kayak apa nih? Apa yang lucu Mbak? Apa yang paling seru? Iya, aduh seru banget sih. Yang pertama kayak mungkin belum dibahas tadi adaptasi cuaca dari negara dua musim ke negara empat musim. Di sana tiap buka weather app, ya ampun. Uh, suhunya tuh satu digit doang gitu. <laughs> Minimal di kita rata-rata di Jakarta 30 31 derajat, nyampe sana 7 derajat gitu. Ya, itu seru sih kayak uh, apa mengalami empat musim uh, apa dan mempengaruhi mood banget ternyata gitu, Pak. Dan benar uh, menarik jadi chef di sana. Nyampe Jakarta udah lupa lagi cara masaknya gimana. <laughs> ya, insting surviving-nya itu yang menang. Exactly, ya, Pak. Oke, okay. uh, suara saya masih kedengeran ya? Enggak. Masih. Oke, okay. internetnya agak ini nih kendor nih. Baik. Um, Oke, okay. ada 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 yang mau ditanyakan nggak? Mungkin dari teman-teman mau menanyakan langsung kepada alumninya siapapun yang ada di sini boleh ditanyakan langsung atau ke Pak Alvin boleh open mic-nya. Gak ada atau malu-malu. Pak Alvin ada yang? Itu ada Mima mau nanya tuh Pak. Oh iya boleh silahkan. Uh, ya Pak. Pak bahasa Indonesia ya. Gak boleh bahasa Indonesia nggak ngerti alumninya. Uh, uh, saya berencana mau uh, lanjut. Yes, di mau lamar gitu Pak ya. Uh, uh, sekarang posi, uh, sekarang saya uh, uh, dosen di Fakultas Kedokteran di uh, Harif Dayatullah di Jakarta. Oke. Okay. Nah, uh, biasanya uh, sebelum pandemi ini memang ada uh, beasiswa ya dari kementerian. Biasanya mora mora lima ribu dokter itu. Nah, uh, karena kemarin pandemi ini kan sempat berhenti. Internet itu. Uh, sebelumnya sih saya sudah uh, ada, kemar- uh, ada uh, dari ada apa seperti ada kayak pelatihan gitu. Sebentar, ada. Uh, online future land future land gitu ya tentang uh, pelajar uh, di situ sih mereka uh, kasih course online nah di situ saya lihat ada uh, profesor yang dari Glasgow 
nggak school itu bagus gitu nah itu saya tertarik untuk menghubungi beliau untuk uh, melamar jadi uh, ini ya ya maksudnya apakah saya bisa melanjutkan ke sana gitu nah memang untuk uh, pembiayaan saya berencana untuk uh, apply yang itu ya pak ya yang dari kementerian atau LPDP gitu nah uh, untuk uh, saya mengajukan misalnya dapat menghubungi dan sampai akhirnya dapat LOA itu eh, bagaimana ya eh, kalau eh, untuk di universitas itu apakah eh, bisa kita mengajukan setiap saat gitu atau ada waktu-waktu tertentu gitu Pak untuk eh, bisa dapat LOA gitu misalnya LPDP ini pembukaan misalnya nanti di bulan April ya Jadi kalau misalnya kita sudah punya LOA, mungkin uh, kita lebih yakin gitu bisa dapat gitu. Uh, apakah untuk kita LOA di University of Glasgow ini bisa setiap saat atau ada waktu-waktu gitu? Oke, okay. okay, Mbak Mima, ya, saya pertanyaannya agak. Ya, jangan dibuat pusing. Ini nanyanya aja udah bingung loh. Apalagi apply-nya nanti. Jadi ya. saran saya satu. Saran saya satu. Eh, tadi barusan saya sudah tinggalkan alamat email saya. Nanti Pak Alvin boleh tolong kirimkan ya. email juga Pak Alvin untuk Mbak Mima komunikasi. Saran saya satu selalu kepada setiap calon PhD yang penting punya niat. Ya. 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 Niat dulu, setelah niat yakin, mulai komunikasi. Saya seringkali ketemu calon PhD. Mereka seringkali kondisi awalnya sama seperti Mbak Mima, nggak yakin. Saya ini bisa nggak sih? Saya bilang mau coba nggak? Kan coba nggak bayar. Nggak dimin- cuma ya. dimintain dokumen doang, disuruh sibuk doang, saya gangguin setiap hari, minta dokumen ini, dokumen itu, disuruh gini, disuruh gitu, tapi nggak ada unsur. uang nggak disuruh bayar apa-apa mau nggak kalau mau dijalankan kalau sudah dijalankan yang sudah terjadi sampai saat ini kebanyakan mereka jadi betah di Inggris nggak mau balik ke Indonesia artinya berhasil ya jadi eh, secara singkat untuk aplikasi PhD itu bisa kapan saja eh, Pak Alvin eh, kalau kalau umumnya kalau dari pengalaman kami ya Pak Alvin ya kalau kita daftar PhD if we apply PhD to Glasgow kita tuh selalu dapat respon antara ada yang dapat dalam sebulan ada yang sampai dapat jawabannya sampai dua tiga bulan memang tapi seluruh semuanya pasti dapat respon antara dapat supervisor atau tidak dapat supervisor jadi kalau bahasanya ditolak itu tuh bukan ditolak mungkin bukan karena kurang akademiknya betul ya Pak Alvin ya tapi mungkin potensial supervisornya yang nggak ketemu ya oke okay. Pak Alvin mau menambahkan Pak Alvin ya jadi PhD ini seperti yang tadi kita udah bilang kan memang lebih sedikit kandidatnya harus lebih aktif ya Pak Hendra Jadi hmm. pertama eh, memang kalau Ibu Mima mau cari the right supervisor mau nggak mau ya aktif dengan masuk ke riset eh, menunya yang di website Glasgow dan cari si supervisor dan langsung aja email eh, ke orang tersebut. Dan itu boleh sih si ke saya langsung nanti dalam beberapa kurun waktu seperti yang Pak Hendra bilang eh, pasti ada jawaban. Tapi memang agak agak lama. karena calon supervisor itu kan nggak PA. Paling tidak saya tahu prosesnya, tahu progresnya. Nanti kalau emang udah batas maksimal satu bulan, I'm happy to follow up. Saya sebagai staff yang di Glasgow itu diberikan akses untuk masuk ke head of department dari school-school yang ada dan mereka akan membawahi beberapa supervisor. Nah itu bisa menjadi satu lain yang saya bisa ke atas dalam arti saya tanya apakah memang riset proposalnya cocok atau perlu diupdate seperti yang Pak Hendra bilang sebetulnya apa yang mereka akan terima adalah sebuah riset proposal memang sudah siap 
secara secara metode research yang memang dibutuhkan. Kalau memang si calon supervisor itu merasa bahwa ekspertisnya kurang, biasanya mereka akan mencarikan kira-kira orang yang tepat. Masalah waktu juga seperti itu. Biasanya waktu memang betul by default semester pasti diusahakan di bulan September intake. Tapi ada beberapa yang sesuai dengan persetujuan dari supervisor yang ada, bisa mulai juga di bulan Maret. Atau bisa dikatakan at any time, tergantung dari supervisor yang mau. Nah itu semua akan didiskusikan sih selama proses dan progres aplikasinya nanti. Nah itu yang nanti itu yang bisa saya uh, informasikan sekarang ini. Gitu. Mungkin itu sih. Oke, okay. okay. thank you Pak Alvin. Jadi Mbak Mima baik-baik sama Pak Alvin biar cepat diterima tuh. Tapi kalau nggak diterima juga ntar kita uber aja Mbak. Kita cari. Saya tahu kan. Mm. <laughs> terima okay. kasih, terima kasih Pak. Sama-sama. Itu emailnya sudah dapat ya? Saya sudah kirim email ya, eh, alamat email saya ya? Ya, sudah. sudah. Oke, okay, saya tunggu emailnya. Mas Ringga, silahkan. Eh, Mas atau Mbak Ringga? Mbak Ringga, Pak. Oh iya, Mbak Ringga, silahkan. Mau tanya apa? Ya, izin nggak hidupin kamera ya, Pak. Iya, boleh. Ah, ya. Yang pertama mau uh, makasih, Mbak, Pak. Oh, buat Mbak Iva karena saya udah dapat offering kondisional dari apa Mbak apa Social and Public Health PhD-nya Pak. Oke. Okay. Wih. Ah. ah, habis itu PR saya ada dua nih Pak. Oh, IELTS saya masih 5,5 tapi syaratnya harus 7 Pak. Habis itu dan scholarship-nya Pak. Ah, jadi mungkin yang mau yang mau saya tanyain ke kakak-kakak atau yang senior yang udah ada di mana Oh, meningkatkan nilai IELTS dan juga cari scholarshipnya soalnya kan sekarang LPDP Glasgow nggak masuk lagi ya Pak itu makanya saya lagi cari-cari info juga gitu Pak Oke okay. okay. Terima kasih Pak Makasih ini PR-nya dioper ke saya nih maksudnya nih <laughs> Bukan Pak <laughs> Baringga saya nggak tahu saya pernah ketemu nggak ya dulu diikut di kursus ITB atau di mana ya Oh ada dulu apa Pak webinar juga di uh, Zoom nggak dulunya Pak sekitar bulan oh. Oktober. Oke okay, oke okay, oke. Okay. Um, pertama kalau saya menyampaikan yang pertanyaan kedua dulu ya tadi kalau saya boleh luruskan mengenai LPDP. Memang betul saat ini LPDP itu membatasi sekali. Mereka tidak membuka semuanya tapi Saya sebetulnya penasaran. Penasarannya begini, mungkin karena dananya memang banyak dikurangi ya akibat pandemi yang terjadi, otomatis mereka mengurangi hanya yang benar-benar prioritas saja yang boleh diizinkan dan boleh mendapatkan beasiswanya. Nah, saran saya, kalau memang sudah ada, tetap dicoba aja masukin ke LPDP-nya. Toh University of Glasgow itu bukan universitas yang Kalau istilah sekarang tuh anak-anak tuh apa teman-teman tuh sering nyebutnya no play play katanya, ya kan? Jadi eh, tetap dicoba, tetap apply ke LPDP-nya, masukkan bahwa sudah diterima, itu satu. Eh, ditanya ranking, semuanya sangat mendukung, nggak perlu khawatir, tidak perlu takut karena rankingnya Glasgow juga tinggi. Nah, kedua kalau bicara mengenai Nanti saya akan minta Mbak Oki sama Mas Anggo untuk cerita nih interviewnya LPDP itu kayak apa ya? Uh, mohon maaf nih sebelum maghrib. Waduh, udah mau maghrib ya? Oh ya Mas, ya udah sekarang deh Mas Anggo atau Mbak Oki boleh cerita nggak interviewnya? Kuncinya apa? Hmm, kalau, saya, kalau saya kebetulan uh, ambil afirmasi, jadi di akhir di program afirmasi itu masih mengakomodir salah satunya uh, UOG gitu ya. Hmm. Nah kalau masalah interview setiap orang sepertinya berbeda-beda. Tapi dari pengalaman saya, uh, saya ditanya banyak hal terkait dengan essay yang saya tulis. Hmm. Jadi pada prinsipnya mungkin beberapa pertanyaan tersebut akan ditanyakan mengenai essay-essay kita. Hanya mungkin pertanyaannya memang bolak balik. Okay. berkaitan dengan hal-hal yang selalu ditanyakan contoh waktu itu rencana studi yang ditanyakan mm-hmm. lalu selain itu motivasi uh, dan juga hal yang kita tulis selama esa di esai 
pada prinsipnya hanya itu aja sih pak kalau kalau dulu. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Mbak Mungkin Oki. Mbak Oki bisa nambahin ya. Ah, Mbak Oki boleh nambahin tipsnya. Kalau saya spesifik di eh ada agar feedback ya. Oke okay, oke okay. di sini jelas oh. suaranya. Oh ya oke, okay. kalau saya spesifik ditanya kenapa mau lompat jurusan. Karena saya S1-nya hukum, S2 yang saya targetin media management. Tapi waktu itu saya argue bahwa uh, saya ingin meneruskan profesi saya dan uh, saya menemukan passion saya di bidang komunikasi. Oke, okay. jadi yang penting yakin ya Mbak? Iya betul, karena kan kita ada 3.000 pelamar, bagaimana caranya kita outside dari 3.000 orang itu, karena kalau soal IPK kayaknya banyak juga yang IPK-nya tinggi-tinggi, pengalaman organisasi banyak juga yang berpengalaman banget, jadi uh, kayak kasarnya sih how we sell ourselves gitu. Iya, betul sekali. Pak Alvin, kalau bicara mengenai IELTS, Pak Alvin, public health itu minta 7,0 ya Pak Alvin ya? Ya memang. Iya Pak. Kolej apa kolej sosial Jadi memang mau nggak mau harus dikejar tuh uh, Pak Hendra. Kita dulu ngejarnya gimana ya Pak? Apa saran terbaik Pak? Ya memang IELTS kan bukan ya bahasa Inggris bukan. Jadi mau nggak mau memang kita harus berusaha keras untuk bisa melihat. Oke. Okay. Sorry, ada feedback kayaknya ya. Iya, suaranya agak putus-putus Pak. Sekarang gimana Pak? Dah, oke. Okay. Ya. Jadi gini, kalau kalau misalnya secara secara banyak memang berbeda-beda masalahnya. Ada yang mereka bisa melalui kursus, misalnya dari tentu, lalu bisa belajar dari uh, les-les secara online yang ada di YouTube sih Pak. Ini kembali lagi ke masalah di Oke. Okay. Dan yang saya lihat sih, ini bukan masalah kita rencana bahasa Inggrisnya, tetapi kadang kita tidak mengetahui bagaimana tes Nah, itu sih Pak. Baik, Mbak Ringga, karena waktunya udah mepet, ini udah mau maghrib, saya tolong dibaca chatnya, saya tinggalin alamat email saya, komunikasi juga ke saya, saya mau kasih saran apa yang saya bisa berikan sarannya mengenai IELTS. Ya. Oke, baik. Demikian kiranya, Pak Alvin, mungkin sudah cukup kita sudahi Nanti kita akan komunikasi lagi dengan semua teman-teman melalui email. Jadi rajin-rajin cek email. Ya, yeah. uh, Shona, thank you so much. Um, I think we had a very nice conversations about experiences of alumni while they were in Glasgow. Everyone is happy. Everyone is sharing about Indonesian food. They never eat British food while in Glasgow, only a bit. So they do enjoy Glasgow very much. Right. Any last word, Shona? Any any message for all students? No, just uh, well, I, I was trying to answer some of the questions in the chat box while, while you were here chatting with me, but um, just to say thank you so much for organizing this session and coming along today. Um, it's really nice to um, it's nice to hear from our alumni, but obviously didn't go exactly understand what was being said, but it's nice to hear it was all positive, and thank you for giving up your time to come on in today. Um, sorry, I think there's a little bit of an echo, I don't know if you can hear me okay, but just thank you so much for any questions in touch with Alpha or Christina Ibex. Right, thank you so much, Shona. Pak Alvin, thank you so much Pak Alvin, Mbak Oki, Mas Anggo, Mbak Anita, terima kasih banyak sudah membantu acara hari ini, sudah terlibat, sudah banyak bercerita. Terima kasih. Um, mungkin itu saja Pak Alvin sebelum ditutup.
any message from you, Pak Alvin? Oke, terima kasih Mbak Oki, Mas Anggo, Anita. Terima kasih Pak Alvin dan Pak Hendra serta tim IBEC. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Alvin, Pak Hendra juga serta tim. Thank you all. Bye Shona, take care. Bye Shona. Oke, okay, bye. So, thank you all and see you again on the next webinar from Glasgow. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Balki.